hardest part is figuring out what you want to master. Focus on your product. Can you tell somebody that they suck? You gotta just go for This is exactly what I want to do for a living. You can't even tell somebody that their breath is fit for life. Check, check. We're live? We're live. John? Live. Welcome to the pod. Thank you, sir. It's been a long time, you know? know. We've been friends since I was just a young buck. I know. In the kitchen at Rob's house. <laughs> watching you guys make shoe designs. How old were you then? When you when I first met you, probably nineteen. Okay. I just remember you like being in the kitchen. Lake Hollywood, right? Yep. Yeah. Working on Robin Big House for all the I think the it was listeners. first season one. Yep. Stuff was just starting to blow up. And just, I remember too, because Sneaker Steve was in the mix too. And I just remember like you guys were like my first some of my first access to like la like real workers right. like in the real business right, right and it was like damn like this dude like does people that work for rob for real of. shit like, but not like, even rob it's not like, work for like D we were at dc I yeah think and working yeah. for dc was even cooler like yeah, that was like good. damn was this like, is the dude who designs the shoes yeah the guy i remember those moments for me too like when i first came out it was like you knew the pro we knew all the pro skaters and shit but then yeah. you got like i got to world i yeah. remember going to world with gino and it was like oh you're you know, Mark McGee. Yeah. Like, you're the artist guy. It's pretty nuts. Or it's going pretty to nuts Girl and seeing, like, you know, Andy Jenkins. You're yeah. like, dude, you're the dude that did all the graphics and yeah. geek out on it, you know? It's nuts how how big that is when you're young. You know what I mean? 100. Like, I don't know. I could probably meet, like, someone high up in government now or something and be like, oh, that's cool. But then I was yeah. like, you're the one changing the world. Seriously. It's so good. It's like meeting your idols. Yeah, but, like, real. the guy who made your idol... Like yeah. the producer, yeah. not the artist. Yeah, yeah, for know? real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, John, I'm glad. Thank you for coming and doing this. No doubt. Um, we're I long overdue. Here. What did you say? I walked here. <laughs> you sure didn't. <laughs> <laughs> you, you definitely did not. Um, let's. I know we've known each other for a long time, but I don't really know your story too well, and I'm excited to hear it. Yeah, man. I mean, it's a long story. So good thing. I hope we, there's uh, no limitations on this. Good uh, thing we're short frame. story long here. I'm going to shoot for about an hour, but we can go well over if, uh, yeah. uh, where are you from? New York? Yeah, I'm from New York. I was, uh, I was born in Long Island mm -hmm. in Uniondale, which is like a small, it's like a suburb. It's a sixth borough. I like to call it. It's the suburb of, of, uh, you know, New York city, Queens or right next to Queens. Mm -hmm. And, um, I, I grew up in an interesting place. Uniondale is like, a middle class suburb of the city, but it's where everyone from Brooklyn, Queens, and the Bronx, when you made money, yeah. you moved. Got That's it. where you moved. Like, oh, I made some money, fuck this housing project yeah. and fuck this apartment. I'm like moving to Uniondale. So the great thing about where I grew up is Puerto Rican, black, yep. Irish, Italian, Dominican, Chinese, Filipino. So my whole block was like, it's very similar to how Queens is. You hear Queens is like a melting pot and yeah. the seven train. You got like 500 different nationalities on one train. Yeah. So that was the greatest thing. And with that, you know, we, you know, uh, that, that environment really kind of like molded me very early. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I'm so jealous of that. Cause like, you know, good old Akron, Ohio is right. just white, 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 right. white, white, white. Right. And I think like, not that I think white with a hood though, like down the street, maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I guess I should have said like white, 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 one black kid. Yeah, you know yeah, what I mean? Like, yeah, there's yeah. a hood. There's hoods tucked in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But man, it but is like just white as white as it is, yeah. man. And I remember when I moved here, I uh, it felt so diverse, right? You know, and like maybe refreshing because that's what you've been. You guys were kind of like brought. Did you like get that hip hop culture through skateboarding? Yeah. Or is that how, it wasn't through anything else. Right? No, only skateboarding. Yeah, right. yeah. Um, yeah, because it's not even that prevalent like in Akron, Ohio. You know what I mean? Like, sure, there are like hip-hop kids, but not. It's like, it's from like emulating like Josh Kalis and Stevie Williams. You gotcha. know what I mean? Like, that's yeah, what it for was. sure. But, um, but anyway, so I remember moving here. It was so it was so diverse. And I remember being into it and being like, oh, this is sick. But it was like, seemed kind of overwhelming. Like, I think, I think the importance of like being exposed to different types of cultures at a young age is like underrated. Like, I think it's like a huge It's benefit. everything for me. Yeah. It was everything for me. My entire, at 44 years old, everything that I do from the moment I woke, wake up until I go to sleep is influenced by everything that happened 40 years ago. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. 
the way I put a, a gold chain on every day. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. The way I like lace my sneakers, the way I do, like the way I run my life, you know yeah. what I mean? Is this kind of like melting pot, you know? And my obviously the brand and and everything that i stand for and the story i've been telling through working at dc shoes or owning a, a brand called gourmet or the buscemi brand it's like this aspirational uh hip-hop urban yeah. skate like it's all everything's involved like everything you yeah, know what i mean yeah. i'm still going out to dinner, I'll be at the nicest restaurant on the world, which is literally, I was at the best restaurant in the world recently. Yeah. And I, I'll, I'll skate the, I'll use my fingers to like skate the, yeah. the, 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 the plate on the table. Yeah. That's That'll never a, go away. Yeah. That's you know true. what I mean? Like, that's true. People are like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm doing a back tail on this plate. You know <laughs> yeah. what I mean? On this fancy fucking right? plate. Right? Do you do, I mean, yeah, of course. I'm, everyone does it. And we right? were talking, I was talking with my friend the other day about like, at what point do you stop seeing the world in form of, in the form of skate spots? It never does. Yeah, I don't think it, it ever I don't think away. it'll ever go away. Yeah. Because, I, I, this is every skateboarder story, I think. I don't know now, but there's a lot of different, I see my son, there's so much influence. Um, not influence, meaning influential, but, but influence just from like stimulus. Yeah. That you can't, you you're pulled away. When we were skating back then, there, that's it. Yeah, there, that was it. That's it. Maybe video games at night. But I was playing Tony Hawk's Pro Skater. Right. But like you would skate. I mean, we would literally skate seven days a week for m no less than five hours a day. Yeah. That's that goes in your whole. Sh that just uh, that that's deep. It's nuts. From like nothing the age else. Of whatever. What 10, else can 12. you do? You can't. I mean, there's no other. I don't think that that's not even a sport. But it's like there's no other sport really that you yeah. could do that. You know, I would argue that Le LeBron James probably basketball, didn't spend maybe as basketball. much time. I would yeah. argue that I spent more time skateboarding or or taking in skateboard content than LeBron right. James did basketball right. in the same age range. Like baseball, okay, you can't get nine people, you can't get eighteen people together, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, basketball, you can go shoot around yourself. Yeah. You get hit a golf ball here and there, but like skating is like it's true. I think, man. and also skateboarding with the rejection. I, you know, I always talk about this. There's so much rejection in skateboarding, yeah. like you're well anyway i wasn't that good but maybe for maybe it's different now yeah. but so much rejection from like well back then from your peers yeah. and then also just the skateboard itself rejecting you because yeah. you're not landing it the yeah. whole you know that it builds your fucking perseverance yeah. man yeah you know what i've been dealing with you lately know what I'm saying? i do and like i was talking to mikey taylor about this the other day too is like I feel like it benefited me in so many ways, but I also have to be aware of where it hindered me because it gave me this attitude that sometimes can hurt me of like, fuck everything and everything's lame. You know what I mean? Because that's like that's the right. skater that mentality, is, no right? Question. And you're so used to being an outcast that you almost, when you grow up as an adult, you can start to do things where you're acting like an outcast. Like I'll right. go to fancy it's a trust LA. Thing. It's a trust thing. Yeah. I don't trust you. Yeah, you don't, you don't trust skate. shit. Yeah. Like I'll go to fancy restaurants or whatever and I'll just feel like I don't belong here. And it's like, well, really, I mean, been here 12 years it's fine but i still have that like chip on my shoulder of like they don't want me here remember that fucking dinner we ate that was like six hours long and like 40 courses that was a podcast Almost, wasn't it it was was it was it a podcast i thought there? it was a podcast right thought down gonna, the street I thought, it was right down the street i thought i was gonna die me too yeah we did a podcast was probably, it was a podcast whose podcast was that I kevin delaney remember. set it up for oh, yeah. from my side but <laughs> we did that and then we had to go to a house afterwards and recap and i was like yeah i don't know first meal was fine whatever oh yeah okay, it was a podcast about food oh, yeah, yeah remember that? we ate and then we, we went to a house to go back. i was gonna die with like dingo <laughs> yes. it was good. shout out to dingo shout out to dingo <laughs> um okay so i'm guessing then that leads me right to my next thing like give me an idea of like what you were doing like you were obviously skating mm -hmm. big fan of hip-hop early right so when when you when you're growing up in this environment in you know nassau county long island and you're right next to New York City. Mm -hmm. We're like 25, 30 minute train ride from New York City. You were skating, but also there's all these other things that would come into your life, right? So you'd be skating in downtown Manhattan and then like you'd be invited to like an art show. Yeah. Because yeah. some chick you knew that was dating some dude that skated was like, you'll come to this. Or you're, you'd be you'd end up at like literally the hottest nightclub in New York City mm -hmm. that had a fucking half pipe in it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then you'd be there, and then you'd be at a loft party that's like you found out was like the daughter of like fucking Steven Spielberg or something yeah. like right like yeah. 
That's so, insane. But then that's all the cool shit that would happen. But for me, I was more gravitor- gravitated towards the hip hop side. Uh-huh. So we'd had friends that worked at record labels or we had friends that were involved with bands or hip hop acts or whatever. Mm-hmm. So we'd be like on set skating in like music videos yeah, and shit. Yeah. So New York was so much going on. I gravitated first and we got to take it back before skateboarding. Yeah. In third grade, fourth grade, I was a break dancer. So, I mean, I'm not afraid to say it. Really? You know what I'm saying? We were breaking. That was like, your first like thing? That was my thing. Like your first identity? That was my identity. I was like Beat Street, Wild Style, Electric Boogaloo, breaking, like, Spiked belts, fucking swishy pants, That's linoleum amazing. floor cut out in the cul-de-sac in Long Island, yeah. like trying to do every like crazy legs fucking like break break dancing move. That's so good. Which was great. And then like listening to Red Alert on the radio and listening to like brand new hip hop songs break on Saturday nights on like the best radio stations in New York, which mm-hmm. were breaking the music first. It was it was break dancing and then like you had your friend that DJ'd and you had your friend that did graffiti and you had your friend that rapped. Yeah. So we were a part of that whole thing. It's so good, man. That's some shit that can only happen around a city like New York. No, no question about it. So yeah. that we were the first, like, so if hip hop started in the Bronx and then it went through all the boroughs and then it went to like Pennsylvania, Jersey, Long Island, yeah. and then, you know, and then Hollywood made breaking yeah. yeah, and then Beat Street and then the whole world had it. But we were the first kind of, and also going back to Long Island and where I grew up is like constantly people coming and moving out there from Brooklyn. So I see like my 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 next door neighbor's Jamaican, mm-hmm. West Indians. And like they brought style with them. They were wearing Gucci and Louis Vuitton and they had a BMW. When my dad had like a Chevy celebrity yeah. and we had like no money for clothes and yeah. then no one cared about it. That dude lived across the street. I'm like, I want to look like him. Yeah. And then the sneaker thing just took over. Like 82, 83, 84, you have, you know, Nike Bruins and all, you know, Jordan came out. I think jo- the first Jordans were out in like 85, yeah. 86. And were you on that or like right away? Pretty much on it right away, but couldn't afford it. So then the entrepreneurial kind of like hustler in me was like, I need a pair of Jordan ones. I need to get them somehow. But I started with like Pumas with fat laces and Nike Bruins with fat laces. I don't. I can't afford a hundred dollar shoe in nineteen eighty four. Yeah. yeah. So it was like shovel snow, rake leaves, and then myself and a few friends learned how to customize hats, and and that's kind of like where we started. We started making hats yeah. for people. Yeah. So this is a long story. Can I ask you real quick? Couple quick things. Yeah. Go Number ahead. one. What were your parents like? What, what was the dynamic like? Like, did they let you go out and explore and like, fuck it, I'm into dancing this week. All right, we'll right. take it. Like, I think right. I want to like start skating. Like, they were down for all that. No, really, definitely not. So now I'm talking about when I'm 11. So yeah. we're gonna fast forward till I'm 15 when I picked up a skateboard when I was 14, and we started venturing into the city when I was 15, which is 1988. Mm-hmm. But lots of lying, lots of I'm sleeping over Gino's house, but. Yeah. Gino sleeping over John's house. Yeah. No one talked to each other. There was no cell phones. It was like rotary fucking phone. Yep. So a lot of lying and, and hustling to get our way to skateboarding and shit. And then kind of like not telling my parents. Like skateboarding was really super frowned upon. Like you're going to kill yourself. You need to wear a helmet or some shit. We're yeah. like, nah. Yeah, my parents tried hard on that one. Yeah, yeah. But like going back, um, I got bit by the sneaker bug early for a few reasons. One, lots of peer pressure. If you didn't have the right sneakers, you were like an outcast in your neighborhood. You looked like a dick. You got made fun of. People were fucking, you know, some people got beat up. That wasn't the situation for us. Yep. And then um, just being in the right place at the right time. You know, we had an amazing sneaker store in my neighborhood that had like all the new shit. And it was just kind of became... You know, people collected baseball cards. People fucking did every whatever. Yeah. I was like a, I was the sneaker guy. By seventh grade, I was like already had, you know, like sneakers like on stash. Yeah, yeah. Weird, like super crazy weird. Yeah. <laughs> and know? that came was this. So, start me back on the like figuring out how to customize hats and shit. Right. Okay. So, we it was a bite. You know what I mean. This kid. This kid, Michael Tolliver, moved from Brooklyn to behind my house, and he was wearing a fitted hat, mm-hmm. bro, a fitted New Era hat in 1984. Yeah. Okay? We saw the hat, we were like, 
yo, first of all, where the fuck did you get that hat? And why does it have like sequins on it? Yeah. So he had a he had a fitted Yankee hat with red sequins on the N and the Y. So it like popped. Yeah. And we were just like, he was way older than us. And we were just like, what the fuck is that? Yeah, yeah. And he was like, we, I got it at Jerry Cosby's near my cousin's house in Westbury. Mm -hmm. So, which is one town over. So we like took the bus, got to this store and the hat was 30 bucks. And mm -hmm. we were like, okay, get back on the bus. We're leaving. <laughs> yeah. So to make another long story short, we got the hats, me and my friend Ryan, we customized them. I did mine in yellow and he did his in white yeah. and we wore them to school. He was at the high school, the kid that like we stole the idea from. Yeah. And we were at the junior high and everyone flipped out. It was like, where the fuck did you get that? I can't believe it. And also new eras are only for athletes. Yeah. Back then, no one knew it was fitted hat. Uh -huh. It was only for game. It was on field hat and Jerry Cosby, the store sold them and they were very expensive, whatever. So kid came up to me. I need that hat. All right, cool. Give me 40 bucks. Uh -huh. So we're making like $10 a hat, $10 a hat, $10 a hat. And literally making like dozens of hats, uh -huh. you know, at 11 and 12 years old. That's insane. And, you know, back then you could buy, you know, a pair of shell toes for 40, 50 bucks. You could buy a Puma for 50 bucks and you could buy a Nike flight or whatever was out at the time, uh, Air Jordan 1s. Yep. So then I was basically taking my money and buying sneakers with it. Yeah. So did that finally that get was you it. the Jordan one? Yeah, I, I mean, I had I had mad sneakers from that hustle. Yeah, and then Harachis came out, and flights came out, and and the Air Revolution came out, which changed my whole like perspective on everything because yeah. that was like that's my favorite shoe, one of my favorite shoes, Agassi. Yeah. Remember the first yeah. Agassis? So is that well, where it also is that where like the like, holy shit, like I can make some dope shit, get money, buy some. That's cool where shit. the hustling, like, where, like, like the hustle started, and then yeah. learning to make a dollar at an early age changes well you know how you know how like like it just my, my son's 10 years old now right he's he's going to be 11 this year yeah right you know seeing him making a, a dollar yeah like how excited I, I i can't remember how excited i was back then but i just remember like it was addictive yeah yeah the hustle was addictive you know and was there ever any once again to, to ask about parents like did they get familiar with what you were doing nah man i didn't have a really i have a great relationship you know my mother passed away a few years ago my my, my dad was like a nine to five guy he wasn't really involved like probably met, very similar to like every of many people's story yeah like they were parents they weren't our friends yeah. it's not like these new parents in yeah. LA, you know what i mean the like, cool parents i'm like friends with my son yeah like me, I'm friends with my son, but we have like, there is a little barrier. Like I'm your dad, motherfucker, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. like chill. Yeah, That's born in like some old school things. For sure, for sure. But my parents, it wasn't like, oh, look, John's an entrepreneur. <laughs> no, it was more like, you don't know anything that I'm doing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. then, and then, and then take me into like high school years. So high school years, you're just skating nonstop? That's it, yeah, so in eighth grade, I started high school in ninth, ninth grade. We were four. I don't know. Everyone starts. Some people have three year high school. Mm -hmm. We were four year high school. Uh, I started skating in the summer of eighth grade. And that's kind of when like the whole like hip hop thing kind of went up, not went away for us. It wasn't just so much about like hip hop. Yep. Once you grab the skateboard, it was like, this is it, man. Mm -hmm. This is what I'm doing. But, and you could see probably through like people that, I grew up with like Keenan and Gino and Eric Rossetti and Ray Matei and Ben Liversedge and whoever was in our crew. Yeah. Like we were, I want to say known as, but because mo most New York skateboarders were this way, we cared about what we were wearing. Yeah. Like first. And I know that's transcended throughout skateboarding like until this day. Yeah. But that's some other, I will say like that's, um, I would almost argue that that's super magnified in new york skate culture no question you know where la it's funny when i first well i'm fast forwarding too fast but we, can go back, we but. cared about yeah we cared so much about our outfits yeah that i remember coming out and when when um i first came out to la we were in huntington beach area and skating with like dill and arson and you know people on the black label team because i came out here because when gino got sponsored he was mm -hmm. living like down there we were like polo and fucking nautica yeah. and like, duh, like and then all these guys were like 
white t-shirt and dickies yeah and fucked up vans yeah. with duct tape that's la so it's funny we went back to like 91 92 we went back to to new york we said goodbye i i literally got rid of all my shit and i was like i looked like i must i i came from fucking i lived in san diego <laughs> yeah. like i had cut off blind jeans white t-shirt long and a pair of like maroon cabs with duct tape on them and what did new york say hat. about that and then you'd see guy mariano and kareem and fucking all these guys come back to new york that were dressing on some like yeah la skater shit and they were like had wallies and nautica jackets on yeah, yeah. so it flipped it was so funny man. that is funny isn't man. that funny how that, that works that is true man yeah i just i think that that's such a like east coast thing like because obviously in ohio we were dressing like i don't know i went through a phase where i wanted to look like rob then i wanted to look like jim greco then i wanted to look like josh kalis like right but you're just kind of wearing a costume there's no actual right. like culture or fashion right. you know what i mean right you didn't like grow up in the hip-hop culture so yeah. you josh Josh wore all that shit because he's just like a hip hop kid that turned skater, just exactly. like we were. Exactly. Where and we were just like, trying we're just to just kind of wearing this anyway. Yeah. And now we're skating. Exactly. Here it was like you grew up in San Diego, like you're Danny Way or something. It's like, yeah, you, you don't you're give a poor shit. just like us, yeah. and fucking you don't care, and your your mom bought you Dickies. Yeah. Because it's like Dickies and white tees and bands are like that's the it. thing. Like, that's it. Like, yeah. And now it's funny, the highest cultural icons of our day you can see on fairfax wearing some fucking dickies yeah. and a white tee yeah. yeah so true <laughs> um so then did did the as you got into skating in high school and all that stuff did the entrepreneurial stuff evolve through that phase or yeah. what were you doing then for yeah, money for sure so um i wouldn't say it it grew i think skateboarding actually it didn't it, it skateboarding stopped everything for me because i was mm -hmm. consumed by it yeah but we had some jobs you know we got you know, I worked at like a bowling alley. We all fucking, we all had kind of like odd jobs, worked at like a restaurant, whatever, just to get a couple of dollars because it really didn't matter. I think because as a skateboarder, yeah, we had some nice clothes and stuff and like things were happening, but the, 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 the lifestyle of skateboarding took up so much of our lives. There was no really time for anything else yeah. to like, the, like we weren't starting companies, yeah. you know, I know like guys out here, you know Kareem and you know Danny and Colin and those guys and they were like starting companies like and having skate shops like pretty fucking early yeah like early 20s yeah we weren't we were just skating you know and then uh, I went to college and then how do how did I put the skateboard down for a couple of years how did you make that that seems like a massive decision yeah why did that happen it was more of a like there was this pressure from my family mm -hmm. that was always there. Um, academically, I was always pretty good, uh, but I was, uh, I kind of, I wouldn't say cheated my way through school, but I like hustled my way through yeah, school. Like you know, finessed. Like, finessed it, like, <laughs> yeah. you know, having girls do fucking homework for me or, you know, figuring out the, the, the test from like the, 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 the class before us. I just kind of hustled my way and, figured out how to like wiggle my way through high school. Yep. And then, you know, all my friends got sponsored. I didn't, I wasn't that good at skateboarding. I was okay. Yep. And they all moved to California and I was like, well, I'm gonna go to college. Uh -huh. So I went to college for two years, hated it. You know, Wu-Tang, Mob Deep, Nas, Red Man, Blunts, 40s, <laughs> skateboarding kind of like, the skateboard went against the wall. Yeah. And it was really just like college, had an odd job, and just like basically high and drunk for my 18 and 19 years old. Yeah. What was your major? I was a business major. Really? I was a business major. Went to St. John's University, met a lot of great people, lots of great stories. You know, going to St. John's in 1992 where, you know, there was a point where there was like we had a party at our school. Mm -hmm. And... DJ Enough, who's a huge DJ, was like the DJ in our like student union and yeah. like Wu Tang performed. Yeah. Straight up. So there was other people like you. Like there wasn't you yeah. weren't like off and on your own, like listening to Wu Tang and no one got it. Nah, nah. Got it was it. like, um, you know, I don't know if anyone remembers, Gino had a method man in one of his video parts. It's like from the tape yep. that I got during the Wu Tang show at my college. Really? That there's a white tape called it was a it was a white sampler tape. Wu Tang came out, so it was Protect Your Neck. Uh-huh. 
and on the B side was Method Man, the mm -hmm. song Method Man. Mm -hmm. And I just had that taped in my fucking in my Honda CRX. <laughs> I came back to Long Island. And I played this shit for. The, I was basically blew all my friends' minds. I think I was still like rolling around and shit, but I wasn't taking it that seriously. Yep. And just tried to do the college thing through the '40s and Blunts era of my life. For sure. And did you do well with all the '40s and Blunts? Like, did you still perform well in school? No. Okay. It was a it was a fucking complete travesty. <laughs> I was, was hoping like, you were gonna say, was, like, "Yeah, I did fine." Finesse no, it was a complete disaster. Okay. So, so, and also when you when you learn the system of high school, where I went to high school, which wasn't really hard. My high school was like yeah. a breeze because I went to private high school, a Catholic high school, and you have to pay to go there. So, like, there's always like kind of there's like this. I feel like there's a weird balance where. They're kind of like they want to make money, yeah. So they're just—they're not going to fail you. Or they want you to win. And then I was winning anyway. But I remember my senior year it was like I was like an A B student, and then like my senior year was just like a complete fucking disaster. <laughs> yeah. But I was already in St. John's. I went to St. John's, and I couldn't figure it out. It was like you got to be at this class. You don't have to be at this class. Literally, the teacher was like, "You don't need to come to class. You can just take the test." Mm -hmm. So I tried to like run that offense yeah. and like never go to class. Yeah. And then like. It didn't work. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I fucking, I was on academic probation year one. I went back for year two. Um, somehow I like begged, borrowed, and steal uh, to stay in. And mm -hmm. I was out that fourth semester of college. And um, and you were you know, just over it. I was just it's over just, it. This isn't it. Was there any pushback from your parents on that? Very much so. It was yeah. like very, very, it was a disaster. Yeah. A social disaster in my house. Yeah. Because I was like, you know, in their eyes, they did, I mean, they knew a little bit about what I, you know, they, in their eyes, they saw their son who became this skateboarder, which they hated, yeah. and which started to drink and do fucking, and smoke weed, which they knew too, and yeah. they were like, you're a disaster. Yeah. And you could have been something, man. What the fuck happened to you? And that, I felt that. Yeah, I was gonna say, was that hard on you at the it time? It was very hard on me. And then like, I moved out, I moved in with a friend, and you know, this is a big part of my story. I'm out of college, I basically get kicked out of college. I'm at my friend Eric Rossetti's house in Westbury at a party summer of 1994 mm -hmm. and I'm sitting at this party and a friend of ours literally the dumbest person in my high school <laughs> literally <laughs> but really popular yep. he fucking rolls up to this party in a 1994 348 Ferrari spider silver drop top fucking tops down it's August it's it's like 170 not a rich out. kid not rich Dumb as fuck, <laughs> and he'll tell you if he's listening. <laughs> you no, know you're he's dumb. Not listening. Um, maybe he is. Who the fuck? At this point, who knows who's listening? Yeah. Anyway, he rolls up. I'm like, everyone's just like, what the? F okay, first of all, I need to know everything about this. Yep. So everyone kind of attacked him. I played the background. Mm -hmm. I have no job. I have no money. Basically, I have. I'm not going back to college. I'm like living with a friend. I'm basically a bum. Uh -huh. The party's ending, he's still there, and I kind of just like go up to him, and I'm like, listen, man, you know I don't do this shit, but what the fuck, bro? Tell me everything. <laughs> yeah. So he goes, I've been working on Wall Street. I work at this firm, it's a bunch of young guys, it's like super fucking crazy, these guys come in, you just like basically attack the phone, you call all these people, you tell them what's going on, and you know, you gotta check it out, you know, you'd be good at it, because I was, you know, he was like, I was pretty popular in high school, like, whatever. Yeah. I, I could talk. You're a talker. I was a talker, yeah, uh, whatever. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm perfect for the job. Sure. He's like, he, you're did, he didn't go to college either, right? No. He okay. he actually, sorry, he had a similar story. He went to college but got kicked out for other reasons yep. and then was chilling and someone came up to him in the same in the same fashion and was like, come, come, and I'll get to the, I'll get to the other part yeah, of this. Yeah. Someone came up to him and was like, yo, come work for me. Same thing, long story short, I get to fucking, a week later, I'm in an interview. He mm -hmm. got me in an interview. Mm -hmm. And I've told this story like a hundred times. I'm in this interview, I walk into this building, there's 500 dudes on the phone like going crazy. Mm -hmm. And you're getting, now you're getting kind of the story, right? You've <laughs> seen the movie, right? Yep. So that's the movie, I walk into it, I walk into an office, there's a woman there, she goes, hi John, how are you? Good. She's like, this interview is going to be pretty short. I'm just going to ask you one question. Okay. 
If I told you to shovel shit against that wall for a year and you'd be a millionaire, would you do it? I said, absolutely. You're hired. Just go sign this application. Start on Monday. I was just like, <laughs> complete mind blown. Like, there's tons of Ferraris, Benzes, Toyota Supras hooked up fucking in the parking lot. Yeah. The place is going ape shit. Everyone's my age. I, I got like, there was like just magnet. Like, I'm attracted immediately. Yep. I'm the hustler guy, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not the weed smoking pothead skater that's not me like i was in the fog a bit like because that was the era but yeah. i was like this is what i want yep went to the mall bought a suit started on monday and then that was the journey it was like you know i i took onto wall street just like skateboarding because skateboarding and my job on wall street being a stockbroker is the same thing yeah don't land the trick don't yeah. land the trick don't <laughs> land the trick Basically, you're on the phone, you make 400, 500 calls a day, you get one guy to say yes, he sends you money, you get paid. Yep. So a year later, I'm a broker, I'm 22 years old, 21 and a half, 22 years old, and I'm like making m more money than you could fucking imagine at the age, uh -huh. right? A couple hundred thousand dollars uh -huh. I made already in one year. Uh -huh. And then everything gets just turned on, like, you know, sneaker habit back on, fucking dope apartment, like, the lifestyle, drugs, parties in the Hamptons, going skiing up yeah. in fucking snowboarding in Vermont, you know, going to the Hamptons in the summer, like just a full blown like, yeah, all in four stock, years of Wall just Street stock guy. guy. Yeah, yeah. And the sad part was, as a twenty-one year old kid from Long Island, that's a little naive about like that side of the world. I was basically in the Wolf of Wall Street, yeah. like in the movie, living it. Yeah. And the I thought you were gonna say like, and then. Jordan Belfort yeah, walks in, right. like it was literally exactly. So so the funny part of the story is, if you see The Wolf of Wall Street, that movie, I'm the second generation of that, more the Got Boiler it. Room movie. Yep. So if you saw Boiler Room, that sh movie was actually written by a guy I worked with. Got it. And when Strat and Oakmont and Jordan's firm blew up, yep. all the guys that like the, the big guys, the big producers, yep went on to start their own firms. And I worked for um, this guy uh, named Victor Wang, who's actually, his name in the movie is Chester Ming. Uh -huh. the, the I Asian remember guy that. From the movie. Yeah, yeah. So I actually worked for that motherfucker. <laughs> That's incredible. And he was an incredible dude. Uh, I hope he's like free. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. You I don't, don't know, know where anything. he's at. I have no idea. This is like literally, what's 1996? I mean, oh, what, yeah. it's like 22 years ago. He could be anywhere. I'm sure he's free somewhere. Yep. And uh, yeah, so that was it. And so how long did that last? And what it lasted? It to end? 1994. I became a broker in '95, and it lasted to about '99 and a half yeah. when the market crashed uh, for the first tech bubble. I basically lost all my book of business. Everyone, you know, we weren't really making a lot of money for people. We were in this like weird situation. Uh, you know, we weren't ripping people off. We weren't doing anything illegal, but we were like buying stocks that were kind of not doing anything. We yeah. weren't buying like IBM and, and Microsoft. Yeah, you know, yeah, we were yeah. buying like risky shit yeah. and like nothing happened and then everything kind of tanked. So again, uh, back to square one. I actually had a few health problems at the time. I was 20, 25 or, or 26 and I, I had a little bout with like, anxiety and panic attacks and yeah, shit yeah. just because of crazy lifestyle no sleep lots of fucking partying yeah. and this high stress job which any day can like go to zero yeah. what did you do did you do anything to like kick get rid of that or you still deal with it or no no, no i'm fine i mean i'm i'm like you know i'm like uh, i you know i'm i'm totally fine with all that stuff i never had like an addiction problem yeah. it was more like the frequency of it like when you live in new york city it's like every night you're out yeah. like you're in a small environment people are having parties you're out at this party this yeah, bar yeah, yeah. this restaurant da, da, da. but just, i mean like the anxiety like did you have to like oh shit hitting. i have anxiety i have to deal with this somehow no, it was a subcount it was a sub like when you have panic attacks and anxiety disorders yeah. it's all subconscious you don't know what's happening until like you're like off on the side of the road like fucking having a panic attack yeah, yeah. it comes yeah. It just comes and hits you. Um, so changing lifestyles just cured it for you. Basically, I I left the the I left being a broker. Um, I actually moved back in with my parents when I was like 26, mm -hmm. and I was pretty much a hermit for like six months. People calling me, "What's wrong with you? What the fuck's your problem?" I was like, you know, I'm just taking it easy. I just I just kind of 
stopped everything mm -hmm. and I kind of came like rose from a phoenix out of the ashes one day and I was like left the house and went to you know you know kind of slowly uh, reassimilated with my friends and shit it was a weird time yeah it was weird and then someone in that time and, and you hear this all the time but when you hear it for the first time it's pretty interesting uh do what you love never work a day in your life yeah someone told me that like back in the, that time because i had nothing going on and, and when you hear that for the first time you're like yeah whatever man that's a fucking that's yeah, like a bumper shit. sticker yeah. yeah fuck that bumper sticker shit yeah so I, it really struck me though and i was like you know what i'm gonna fucking do that so all my friends own like you know, all my friends owned skate, like Tim started DVS yep. and fucking, I had friends that were working at DC and, you know, Rick from Fresh Jive and like all these people in L LA, I'm a friends with Eric and, and Guy and, and, you know, Tim and that whole crew, yep. Rick and Megan from Girl. I'm like, you know what? Maybe I should go work in the skateboard industry. I yep. fucking love it. I know everyone, they love me. Yeah. So I became a sales rep for Four Star. Amazing. And, and that, that was, was like from that was like my little gateway, like my little. They opened the fucking like trap door, and I'm now I'm in the skateboard industry. Yeah, you know. And was that from like calling your friends and be like, "Yo, I want to come out there. I want to do something." Literally, like, just try like this. calling people, like, "Hey, do you think?" And I was still in New York. I was like, "Can I help in some way?" Or fucking like, "What do you got going on?" And like, I'll never forget. Megan was like, "You know, we got a we got four star, and there's like no rep for it in New York and like the East Coast. Do you want to try it?" Fuck you, kidding! Yeah. I'll do anything right now. Yeah. I fucking hated it. Oh, so that was still in New York. I was in New York. Uh, and and you it hated was it. Fucking the worst thing in the world because I'm a little bit of a diva. I yeah. had an ego a little bit. You know what I'm saying? I'm yeah, of front. course. And you're fresh off of Wall Street. I'm fresh off of Wall Street. <laughs> I'm like, I'm driving like I still got like a fucking sick ass Audi. Yeah. You know, I got the you know, I got I had it going on a little bit, and I was like, now I got to drive to like this skate shop in Red Bank, New Jersey, <laughs> yeah. and like sell a T-shirt. Yeah. The first trip I ever took, I knew it wasn't for me, uh -huh. but I kind of persevered for a couple of months. And That's I said, a rough job. I was like, yo, I, I give a lot of respect to guys that are sales reps because it's you have to like, you have to be a certain type of person yeah. that likes dealing with people like that. It was just hard for me. I, I'm not, I'll, I'll chalk it up to me being a fucking diva. <laughs> sure. But sure. Um, I remember calling Rick and Megan and be like, I can't do this. Sorry, guys. I just can't fucking do it. How but long did it last? About six months. Okay. But like on and off and not really working that hard. Yeah, trust yeah, me. Yeah. It was real. I went to like a trade show. And I was just like, you know, you see, like my friends are like the captains of the industry. Yeah. Like, yo, you work. You sales rep? Yeah. It's like the worst job in the industry. Hey, pretty much. Yeah. I have a lot of respect for those guys. I think it's not the worst job if you started way younger than me yeah. and then now you're like a 30 year old guy and you got like you're making a couple hundred grand a year yeah. you got mad like accounts but man like but driving I like around a, i was the bottom of the love bottom, yeah driving around like hey man you see the new fucking you know yeah like, street look at pirate this. it's bro. like a different red than everyone else's red yeah like, you ever I see promise. that you ever see that <laughs> clip on like on uh i think someone did it like sales reps talk I don't the think way so. sales reps talk no oh, you should cut this into this it's on youtube it's on youtube we'll cut like, it sales in. rep talk like Green, yeah, probably the red. You know what I mean, like, like, <laughs> yeah. like, yeah, exactly. Just all the like, buzz, all like, the yeah. Net thirty, net never. <laughs> like, we'll that cut account, that in. Like, it's like, like sales rep talk. Yeah. It's like a thing. It's man, I have, I have a lot. Like you said, I have a lot of respect for those guys because it is a grind. It's a total grind, man. So then what? So then, um, I'm leaving a part of the story out. DVS and Lakai, they started a brand called Clay mm -hmm. with Sung who was a, a friend, an old friend of mine from New York. And Clay was like the lifestyle. I remember that. Yeah, it was like a lifestyle, like skate inspired lifestyle brand. Like like the brand that skaters wore after they stopped skateboarding, yeah, right? Yeah. So I was actually repping for that along with Four Star during that six month kind of journey. And I went to a trade show in Vegas with it, et cetera. And you know, I'm friends with Tim Gavin and blah, 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 blah. And after I said, I can't do this, I can't, I fucking, I can't do this. Yeah. I remember talking to Gavin a bit and he's like, look, man, you need to get out here. Just see what happens out here. Yeah. Um, so I packed my car. Me and Gino actually drove cross country together. And this is right when cell phones were like, you actually had a cell phone. Yeah. I'll never forget this. Tim's like, come stay with me and see what happens out here. 
I had nothing going on in New York, but I had a nice car and I had a couple of bucks and I fucking said, all right, cool. So I drove cross country and I came out here basically just like looking for a job, yeah. like going, but actually it turned into like going to AD and, and to like Joseph's every night and playing golf in the morning. And like, cause all my friends were like lit. Yeah. Like, like I was living at Eric Hostin's house. Yep. Like Tim Gavin is like the head of marketing for like DVS when they were doing like millions and millions of dollars of business. And like, you know, going to this nightclub, it just turned into kind of like a party, but I thought something was going to happen. Yep. I remember meeting with Rick from Fresh Drive, maybe do some marketing. And then Tim was like, um, why don't you be the, the team manager for DBS? Uh -huh. I was like, hmm, that could be interesting. <laughs> and then that didn't happen. They get like, and then thank God, it would be like, imagine like, hey, Damon, how many boards do you oh, need? That's another like, rough one. Like, like, that's a rough guys, one, Guys, it's like, tour time. Like, dude, like. Driving around what? in a van. Okay, I'll be there. Like. You guys better be up at eight. Like, like yeah. imagine me. Like, uh, it was so I dodged not a, a few good bullets. Not a good job for a diva. Hell no. Hell no. So, uh, about I'm out here for it was the summer. It's got to be like I never know the time frame. It's probably like two or three months. Let's say it's three months, okay. and I have nothing to show for it. <laughs> I got like lots of time at the club and lots of golf fucking in yeah nothing to show for it and i'm like done i'm like and it was kind of funny in a way but not really yeah so literally one of the last time one of the last days i'm here i'm, I'm literally gonna pack my car and fucking drive back to to new york i'm at what's that school what's that school when you go downtown paul has a bunch of tricks there stairs Big fence on the right off of Beverly. What the fuck's the name of that school? Um, anyway, I oh, man. Lincoln, not Lincoln. Yeah, ah, I'm blanking on it, man. I'm it's blanking Katie. on the school. So, yeah. so I'm with Eric, and he has to go like meet Ty there to like film. I think they're like filming for whatever they're filming for, and I'm like jumping fences. I'm like, what the fuck am I doing? Is it Belmont. It's not Belmont. Is Belmont. It? Belmont. There we go. Belmont. I'm like hopping fences with no job in LA with no money. <laughs> in between golfing. Exactly. No money, borrowing money. What happened? Sorry, one second. Uh, just turn it towards you. Yeah. Oh, you lose. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, you Sorry. Go. Good now? Yeah. And my phone rings. Somehow my phone's getting paid for. <laughs> Shout out to my wife, Maria, for paying my phone bill. Was she your uh, girlfriend then? Yeah, she was my girlfriend. Wow. Okay. But she was like a long distance girlfriend at the time. Oh, she was in New York still. She was in New York wow. and she understood the the journey I had needed to go on. <laughs> yeah. And she like held me down. And we were, I mean, we were like together together, but she was like, you're a fucking need to go do something. So I support you going to LA and like figuring this shit out. Yeah. And she came out and visited or whatever. But anyway, so I get a phone call from Wei Yin Chang, who was the creative director, uh, head designer at DC Shoes, who I knew through Sung, who owned clay yep so he's like uh i heard you're looking for a job and i was like trying to like play it cool i'm like yeah what's up <laughs> maybe maybe i don't know <laughs> things are happening yeah. you know play that cool guy role and he's yeah. like well we just hired dc just hired this guy from from nike who's like kind of reconfiguring the dc world to be more like nike where it's like DC was kind of had designers and yeah. then like Ken and Damon and like Rob and they'd be like, okay, let's do this. And like, okay, good. Yep. Instead of having like a real like footwear kind of like product line management and like category management, and like sourcing and fucking, you know, like coloring and design and sales. Like real shit. Like a real, <laughs> yeah. a, a real footwear company. Yeah. So he's like, they're trying to hire someone to be like this guy who bridges the gap between like fashion and like what's happening in the world yeah. and sales. Yeah. It's called like a trend forecaster. Mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll talk to him. He's like, come down and interview on Monday. And this is like a Friday. I'm like, fuck, I don't have a resume. I have shit, bro. I have yeah. nothing to show for myself. I'm like completely, I have nothing. Yeah. I call my friend Dennis in New York. He's like the wizard. Like everyone has their friend that's the, the, the graphic design wizard. I'm yep. like, dude, make me a fucking, please make me a resume. Yeah. So we came up with the idea because I don't know, I don't think you ever had to apply for a job in 2001. Maybe you did. Mm -mm. In 2002, 
it 2000, the end of 2001, I started in 2002. The end of 2001, the trend actually was like weird resumes. Really? Like there was quirky? A, or? There was a trend. Uh -huh. Like like a resume like fucking, you know, that like uh, that had lights on it or fucking a resume that wasn't a resume or, or a resume that was a photo. Yeah. I saw people doing like photos. Yeah. Basically, this is my resume, a photo. So I said, let's fucking do something cool. I took a photo of me standing in front of my sneaker collection because I actually had a big sneaker collection at that time. It's just basically me like with my, my arms folded yeah. with me in front of like 400 pairs of sneakers behind me, Jordans and shit. Uh -huh. And I put my name in the Supreme font, uh -huh. John Buscemi with a red box. And it said, industry insider, sneaker connoisseur, overall good guy. That's my resume. That should be the title of this episode. Seriously. <laughs> That's the fucking title. That is my life. <laughs> so good. So, so I, nothing else. Nothing else. I go to Kinko's and print this fucking thing out. I have because Wayne's like, you're gonna meet with a few people, bring a few resumes. And I don't know. I've never interviewed at a corporate job. Yeah. This was super corporate. I had to meet with HR. And then you gotta meet with like the president of this. And then I met with like Pam Zam, the PR person. Mm -hmm. Then like lunch. And then <laughs> meet with Ken and Damon. And then meet with like this guy Jeff and then meet with the guy I have to interview with and then like a break and then it was literally like a five hour interview yeah so I go down there I have all these resumes in a folder and I don't know what to wear so at the time I was wearing a lot of supreme shit and fucking like pink t-shirts and like seven jeans just came out yeah. and it was like I look I must have looked like an alien down there I had like the sickest pair of like Japanese I'll never forget I had purple air trainer threes in purple that were like only available in Japan. Mm -hmm. Seven jeans that no one saw. Had a Supreme box logo hoodie on with like a pink t-shirt coming out of it and like a Yankee fitted backwards. Yeah. I mean, I gotta say the outfit stands up right now. I Maybe mean, not the jeans. It still does, and that seems perfect for industry insider. Like we need I someone just to bridge up the like, gap. Yeah. It was funny, like you know, like uh, that scene in Swingers when like Vince Vaughn's like, like yeah, I fucking nailed it. Give me the job. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I just showed up and I felt like I got this fucking job. Yeah. Give me this motherfucking job. Yeah. I, I was like, I'm, and also I'm at the end of my rope. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I'm this person that I know like can help people, but with no opportunity. Yep. So I show up, I go through all these interviews. I'm like literally sitting in people that are just like fucking square as a fucking box. Yeah. Here's my, in, my resume. Here in the picture, <laughs> my fucking name. And they're like, this is your resume? I'm like, yeah, that's my resume. Okay, cool. So do you have any experience? Nope. That's what you said? I said no. Yeah. I have no they asked me. I have to know if you tried been? to finesse. They're like, no, well, you know. No fina well, I finessed in the right areas, but they're saying, have you worked yeah. in, in footwear design before? Yep. No. And then they asked me, so what do you know? Like, why are you here? Why are you here? And then I'll just then I got you. Yeah. I own these many sneakers. I've done this. I've been designing shit since third grade. I fucking I know this person. I have access to this. I know about this. Um, you know, uh, there's a whole sneaker culture that's happening in London and Japan that I'm kind of tapped into. And I'm leaving. I'm actually leaving some of the story. I would go back um, when I was on uh, after stock the stockbroker part yep. when I had the health problems. Before I went to California, we were and we can get back into it. I was actually hunting and digging for rare sneakers uh -huh. like with people just like, like as Chris a hobby Hall. as a hobby yeah but that was getting so that my, paid off it paid off a bit we made a couple bucks but it wasn't it was nothing it actually get i made enough money to be able to drive out to california and have like five grand in the bank yeah i mean it paid off in that meeting because no that meeting question. now you just look like well whoa. because the only thing is that after those five interviews one interview only mattered it was the guy that i was interviewing for yeah and he already knew who i was and he just wanted to see me in person pretty yeah. much to see your outfit maybe i was the outfit i uh, basically i was the outfit for a bit and then i opened my mouth he was like you're exact well he didn't say it there he was like cool like i'll get back to you yep. it was like real corporate like that so i ha and he loved the resume actually after i was hired he, it was on his wall in his office because he loved it that much everyone really? loved it Is but then, after quicksilver after the quicksilver is, acquisition of is, dc it's funny that you brought that up it okay. was literally five months okay. before okay. six months before so, uh, or maybe a year. Um, so I have this interview, I go back to LA, my car is packed and it's around Thanksgiving. And I said, you know what? Just in case I get this job, I'm not gonna drive back to New York. I'm gonna fly back for Thanksgiving. Uh -huh. So I fly back to Thanksgiving. I'm in my house with my dad. Like, I don't know if you go back home and like when you hang out with your parents, the older you get, the less amount, 
time you can spend with your parents. Yeah, absolutely. Even though I love them, you yep. know what I mean. I go back every year for uh, it's for like any holiday. It gets a little bit shorter every year mm-hmm. because they're, you know our parents are crazy. Yeah. So I'm there. I'm there for like three days, four days. Thanksgiving goes by. The weekend, and then it's like the Monday. No job. Like no job. No call. No call. Mm-hmm. No money. Um, you know, Maria's in the city. I'd go there, but I'm staying with my dad. I'm going back and forth. No call, no call, no call. It's literally probably 10 days. And I'm like, I call Wayne. And I'm like, dude, what's up? He's like, Dan, the guy who was interviewing, he's like, he's out of town. He's going to call you. He's going to get back. He's going to call you. Another fucking couple days go by. And finally, my dad's like house phone rings. Like, I don't know. Do you ever get a call at your parents' house and they like answer it? Hello? Uh-huh. Oh, this is uh, Dan. Is John there? One second, please. Yeah, I remember that from childhood. But like that was my 26-year-old John. And it's like, oh, my God, this guy's going to think. How did he call? Why did he call this number? <laughs> my number. I probably put my home phone number on the fucking application. Oh, my God. Like my whole life shot in front of my eyes. Yeah. So I get on the phone. Hey, what's up? Hey, uh, you're home? Yeah, I'm home for the holidays. I just came up with whatever. He's like, hey, can you be uh, a can – you, can, you, can you come back? I'm going to be in L.A. tomorrow. Can you come back uh, tomorrow? You know, you coming back to L.A.? I'm going to be in L.A. tomorrow. I'll be there. I'm, I'll be there. Yeah. I'll fucking be there. <laughs> so now it's like my second interview. Yeah. So I get there. He's like, meet me at Fred Siegel on Melrose. You know, like that little restaurant. In the yeah. Back. Okay, cool. I'll go to Fred Siegel on Melrose. Hey, what's up? Shoot the shit. How was Thanksgiving? Fucking appetizer. Fucking entree. Fucking coffees are coming out and dessert. Dude, I'm like, gonna, I'm freaking out. Because of how much it is? No, I'm freaking out because it's like, Bro, I'm been with you for an hour. Like, yeah, is yeah, this yeah. an interview? I'm and like, you're not I'm, even talking about the work, the job, dude. I fucking get up, dude. I, I snap. <laughs> I got up and I was like, I love you, man. Like, we've had a great talk. I'm gonna. I just gotta know, man. Like, do I got this job or not? Yeah. And he's like eating his dessert. He's like, you had the job two weeks ago, bro. Sit down. I fucking start crying. You did. I started crying, dude. At Fred Siegel. I started crying in front of my new boss. In Fred Siegel, I hugged the dude. Not like, not like. Weeping. Not weeping. It was just like, you know when you like watching a movie on a plane? And yeah. You, yeah, yeah, yeah. You get a little choked up. You know what I mean? The I just last love the scene idea. of Rudy. Yeah. The last scene of Rudy or something. You know? I just love the idea of like you playing it so cool for so long. Because it was pent up, Yeah, bro. and then you're like. No job. No nothing. A, 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 jo- a dream scenario job, too. Yeah. Yep. You know? Got choked up, man, and I hugged him and like, fuck, bro. So then and he it's was odd. like, cool, and it was like, he's like, D- you start fucking Tuesday or whatever. I'm like, holy shit, man! Yep. I fucking made calls. It was like fucking partied like that whole weekend. I just, <laughs> yeah. it was like nuts. Yeah. I went nuts. And then, um, okay, now I got to move to San Diego. I have yeah. no place to live. It was just like, pff, just like. My, you know, my girlfriend. It's like a whole new life. Yeah. It's like you have a new life. Here yep. you go. You want it. There you go. Yeah, there you go. So I get down to D.C. and um, I don't have any skills either, dude. I don't know what the <laughs> fuck I'm going to do. <laughs> like, what do you do walking I lied out the first my way, day. basically. I didn't lie. I mean, I hustled my way into a job that I knew I could do, yeah. but I had no skills for. Yeah. Do you know Excel? No. Like, <laughs> no. Yes. Yeah. I wrote yeah. yes. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. do you know Photoshop? Fucking kidding me? I wrote the <laughs> software. <laughs> So what do you do? Like you walk no. in there on day one, like Zero. fuck. Where do I? I don't even own a computer. <laughs> no, literally, they're like. I think I had an email address on Yahoo, which I never used because I didn't have a computer. Yeah. So now it's like, literally, day one is like HR meeting. Go to get your computer, mm-hmm. but you have to go to Apple in Carlsbad or wherever it was, or in wherever. Like, go get your like it was a list of things. Go get your computer. Here's your American Express Platinum card. Here's your like I'm like. I was in like an alternate universe of yeah. things that I heard before that happened. It's like expense account and yeah. fucking here's your this and you need to go get a passport because you'll be traveling internationally. I was like, bro, it was nuts. <laughs> That's so nuts. Two weeks after two weeks after I started this fucking job at DC, I was in Berlin at a trade show. Let me ask you this. Did you just like, like it's crazy? It's My whole insane. life changed. It was a complete like But did you hit did you essentially get in there? get to work and like it was just on to your new life from then or were there any like big hiccups like, there was, was there any, huge hiccups was there that i there was huge hiccups and then it, the ninth grade john kicked in like let me go talk to joe abajian like the designer like yo fucking help me out yeah. do my homework yeah 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 yo wayne fuck please help me with my homework yep. and then i just hustled that 
And then really the crux of the job was like a lot of complaining. Yeah. About, you complaining? Yeah. Uh, like, and a lot of fucking friction, a lot of like co controversy and, and a lot of like, I need to talk like like group chats like guys you guys fucking are terrible yeah. this is the worst place i've ever this is the worst design i've ever seen in my life yeah like i don't know dc had a moment where it was like clockers and lynxes and 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 you know what a 15 fucking deer dick shoes yeah. and whatever you know what i mean like that there's some good stuff there yeah okay but now you're in 2002 mm -hmm. And DC wants to like have like a Wu Tang dunk, mm -hmm. and uh, you know the sneaker wave. Yep. That fucking tsunami was coming, and I was already behind it, and, I, and that's why you hired me. Yep. So if I'm not going to tell you the real shit, yeah, I had to like ha break a lot of fucking feeling. I had mm -hmm. to hurt a lot of feelings, mm -hmm. which helped. And also, Ken and Damon were so far removed, from, not far removed. They'd be at the design meetings, but they weren't like in the trench. They yep. were up. They were in the skybox. Yeah which is fine, but I was kind of like helping them too, like seeing briefs that they would come in and be like, yo, we gotta do this. I'd be like, yes, but let, let's do this, yep. you know? Yep. Um, so I think people liked me for the most part, but ha dealing with salespeople, they're like, we need this because this is happening in the world. And I'm like, I know, bro, I'm with you. And yep. then the designer's like, well, we're gonna do this. And we're like, nah, bro, Got like it. you're wearing flip flops. Got it. So that was like the majority of, here, of your dude. of your time spent was just right. getting people on the same page Absolutely. to try to like take advantage of a shit. You have to influence like designers to say like, this is the cool shit guys, that was my job. And you know, it was an uphill battle always because DC, when you when you start a brand and you own a brand, you're kind of pigeonholed. Yeah. Like if Young the Reckless wanted to do like fucking like, you know, Fifteen hundred dollar leather jackets. Yeah, you might have a hard time doing that. <laughs> Very right. So I was like, let's do things that have there's some connectivity. We can have a little bit higher price, and then have the evangelists and the cool people like try and like rock it, and let's see if that works. Yep. And we had a few small wins, but at the end of the day, DC still they were kind of not only was it like time for they were selling to like family footwear channels and fucking zoomies and like blowing the brand out to yeah. make money yeah i'm at i'm trying to push a uh, an 800 800 pound rock up a mountain like, let's sure. make it cool and that's all during a time when dc grew like insanely yeah, it was like, <laughs> was it like 100 there were like 100 when i started it was 500 a, or something when i started it was under 100 quicksilver bought it the funny thing is They've got all these great people hired yeah. so they could sell the company to Quicksilver. Yeah. And what happened was Quicksilver bought a company with, with a staff that was a, a fucking A team. Yeah. And that's why I went from 100 to, I don't know, five. I was gone. Yeah. I was gone a year and a half after that, but I think they went to 500 million or something it's or insane. more. insane. What year did you leave? 06. I was got there it. for almost four. So you, were probably, you had to be just Three there. Three and a half years I bounced. But just the beginning of like Robin Big and then you were out. So Robin Big started, and then I was yeah I was out yeah when I, when you saw me in LA I was like I was out I was kind of on my way out. And did you already know Rob from the past? I got the the best Rob story. Can we have it? Yeah. So <laughs> this is I love telling the story because uh -huh. it's a good story. So obviously I knew who Rob was. Mm -hmm. Rob didn't know who I was. But you knew him as Pro Skateboarder Rob. Absolutely, I knew yep. him Pro Skateboarder Rob. I knew him as yeah fucking Pro Skateboarder Rob. Like yep. I think more. Not even on the DC side, more on like the alien maybe side. Yep. Because DC didn't really have a big video. I mean, through ads and stuff. I knew R Rob was like, I always knew he was more like kind of like us, like yeah. hip hop dude. Yeah. So, okay. After I got back from, after I got back from my first trip, I was, I was literally at DC for a month. I'm back and my first engagement, I guess you could say, my first like big project was to work on Stevie's next shoe. Uh-huh. So I'm working with these guys. And again, it's like, just always just like, what do you, <laughs> I mean, the shoe looks good, but like, what are we going to do, man? Yeah. Like, what are we going to do? This is Stevie Williams, guys. It's yeah. not just another shoe. See, the problem at DC was like, they got to crank things out. Yeah. You know, you know, how many shoes does Rob have? Seven, 18 shoes. So, yeah. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like, you know, everyone, it was just like too, it was just, I felt like it was too much happening. It was just too much great things that were like, this is great, guys. Why did you? Why do we need to make 1.5 of that yep. or 0.5 of that? Yep. So I said, why don't we do Stevie's first shoe 
and like retro it and then do like a whole new thing with it. And they were like, okay, that's a cool idea. Let's hear more. So I had an idea of doing a vintage, uh -huh. like how champagne works. Yep. So I said, Stevie won. We're going to do it in champagne colorways. Forest green, the yellow mustard from like Cristal. Yep. We're going to do like fucking white and gold and all these things. And I presented it. I took an old shoe and I wrapped it. At the time, Cristal was like the only thing that anyone talked about. Yeah, yeah. I, I went to the store because I had an expense account. <laughs> and I bought a real Cristal bottle. Uh -huh. And I took the Cristal cellophane, uh -huh. if everyone knows the Cristal. Mm -hmm. I put the shoe in it. I put the shoe in the fucking champagne box, closed it, and put a DC logo on it. And then I just waited for my time to talk. Uh -huh. So we're at the Rivi not Riviera. At the Aviara, like four seasons or something, because uh -huh. DC was real fancy at yep. the time. And like when you had a sales meeting or a design meeting, it was like, we can't just meet in this big conference room. <laughs> yeah. We need to go to like the four seasons, yeah. which I never really don't understand, but I was feeling it. Sure. And there's like Colin, Danny, uh, Rob, all the fucking executives, Ken, Damon, my boss, this and that. I walk on stage, no one knows who I am yet. I get introduced. I got the, you know, I got the outfit on. Yeah. And I'm like, hey, what's up? I'm John Buscemi. I'm just going to present uh, what I think this new Stevie Williams shoe should be. And, you know, Rob's just like, you know how Rob is. He like stands up. Yeah. <laughs> Who's this motherfucker? <laughs> Let's hear it. Come on. And I dude. just remember seeing Rob stand up and I was like, I'm with you, bro. <laughs> We're right here. No, because I felt it. Because you know how Rob is like. Yeah. Yeah. I want to hear it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he saw the Cristal box, right? So I just go through and I say, hey, you know, Stevie Williams, East Coast, bottle popping, fucking, mm -hmm. like, we should do this and be inspired by this. And I don't remember, I don't know what the fuck I said. Yep. All I know is I opened a Cristal box and took a fucking cellophane out and I pulled a shoe out and it's like, this is what it should be. And yeah. Rob was just like, I'll never forget, he, he, he openly, outwardly, like, started, like, like, what the fuck is, who is this guy? Who the fuck is this guy? Who hired this guy? In a negative? What the in a, no, in the most positive way ever. Oh, I thought he was like, get him out of here. No, it was, was like, like it was like, we just became best friends and yeah. I never even met the guy. So I'll never forget, everyone's just kind of like, <laughs> like, re, like, no one knew what happened. Yeah. I don't even think my, I think people were like excited about it, but like, how are we going to do that? This doesn't make any sense to us. This yep. doesn't make, like, I love that, that yeah. they didn't make sense because that's fine. That's why I'm here, right? Mm -hmm. And then my boss was like, good job or whatever. And then Rob was just like grabbed me and we just talked, I remember, for like, who knows, maybe an hour. Like, yeah. And then that was it. And then I was working on stuff with him Amazing. and I worked on Josh's shoe and worked on, you know, the lifestyle collection. I did fucking stuff for Japan. Me and Sung would uh, fly out to Japan and work on, I was just, it was a whirlwind, man. I was I was in the airport every five days. Yeah. I was just killing it. And then what made it come to an end? Probably boredom because of the corporate, well, boredom because you have to, you have to work in a box in that corporate environment. Yeah. And I think also when you're, a, when you're like a low level employee at DC and there's like, footwear news comes to interview you yeah <laughs> and like yeah. i started becoming like this thing inside this building and it was like my boss is like why is there a camera crew in your office yeah. i'm like yeah. they're interviewing me because of a shoe i designed mm. for you guys but they weren't down for that it seems like that's exactly ken and damon i want. think were but my boss there's a level under yeah. it, like yo you just work for me yeah and i was like nah b i'm a fucking <laughs> I, I'm not, I'm not going to be here much too much longer. You know <laughs> yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah. And then I was supposed to get a big job mm -hmm. that I didn't get, and that was the fucking final straw. It was like I feel at like DC? at DC oh, I was supposed it, to get like it. the top spot got of it. my world. Yep. And I was like, I need this shit. And they were like, I don't know if people were hating. I don't even care what happened. It was it was it just didn't happen and then it was like it was already two years into the quicksilver thing it was a fucking yeah it was kind of a mess anyway and the whole place turned into we need to make money yeah. and it was like well i can make money by doing cool shit yeah, but yeah, you won't yeah. let me do it yeah so i bounced and uh where'd you end where'd you go from there did you have a plan when you bounced i did so uh in my office about six months before i left and this kind of can go into our talk about like you know advice 
I started a business with a few friends called Gourmet, which is a footwear brand, which actually wasn't a footwear brand when it started. It was like this Italian American, you know, Guido chic sportswear brand with like cashmere sweatsuits and, you know, very early, very too early. Actually, you started that out of DC. I started it with my with Lucci yeah. and Greg Johnson while I was at DC. Got it. Like nights, weekends, yep. emails during the day, yep. secret like mission, yep. and. I knew that wouldn't be able to support me because at that point I was making good money and I had now my I'm now married yeah. and I now live in San Diego with my wife. I had to find something else. So uh, our friend Greg was working for Lotto, which is a not the lottery, but Lotto is a brand in Italy that does tennis and soccer. Got it. They wanted to break into the U.S. market and they had a big budget. So he was like, "You come up and do you be the." like marketing like product director guy like to do kind of launch this brand we'll give you a bunch of money and you can like move up to la i was like fuck yes yeah so i was like i literally pieced out like the week after they already knew i was i was coming to the office three days a week and fucking yep. you know i already had a i had like an interview i had a fucking article in like gq or some shit and fuck it was like yeah, i was lit yeah. i was lit yeah yeah you were out and there. no one gave a fuck because like at that point you know all the people i wanted to work with like you know, I think like even like Tom Jones had left and fucking Ken and Damon were never around because they were rich and yeah. fucking hanging out and doing their own yeah. thing. And, you know, it was just turned into a different thing. So I left and I went up to work at this thing, Lotto, which was pretty cool. And the cool thing was we were getting paid to basically just do gourmet all day because yeah. the Lotto thing was like literally like a couple hours a week. Is that when you got like the gourmet offices and yeah, stuff? Yeah, so we got the gourmet office up on Sunset Plaza. Yeah. And we, we released this... I mean, you know, I talk to Jerry from Fear of God. I'll talk to guys from fucking 424. I get people talk all the time like, dude, do you remember Gourmet's shit the first season? Like people still talk about it because we took a huge, huge risk. Yeah. We spent like hundreds of thousands of not our own money, but our partner's money yeah. developing like one of the sickest sportswear collections like out. Yeah. Cashmere hoodies and sweatpants and fucking these sick denim denim and leather jackets and it was way ahead of its time but it literally released that capsule show in like 2008 when the whole world was about to like come to an end yep. no one bought it fucking it tanked no one fucking cared about it but the season the second season that we we, we went to show it we released these these like sneakers with it the, the, the gourmet sneakers if yep. you remember the jordan flips yeah and everyone like was like okay this apparel is cool. It's really expensive, but what's up with these sneakers? Oh, that's how it went. And everyone bought the sneakers. That's and we went, crazy. We sold no shoes, and right in the middle of the worst recession in the world, they were like undefeated. Fucking Dave's Quality Meats, like uh, size in London, Japanese accounts. We, we sold hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of. And that was just from like the right thing connecting, like the it product. Was, the, that was it. It was it. Yeah. It was like Jordans were. It was right when you didn't want to wear fat shoes. It was yeah. like right when you wanted to wear like a creative wreck or like a Chuck Taylor, like mm -hmm. thin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was like that that era of the thin sneaker. Yeah. And we were like, we love Jordans. We're some hip hop like dudes. Yeah. But I can't wear like a Jordan Seven on my foot. I look like I look crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Now I mean it's back like these fat of shoes. Course, but, yeah. But then it was. But yeah. then it was like slim. Yeah. So we slimmed out the Jordans and we put them on the Chuck Taylor sole and it just went crazy that's so good did you ever get i don't think i ever asked you this did you ever get any sort of cease and desist or anything oh yeah a lot of them we didn't get a cease and desist we got like a 15 count federal lawsuit the size of a book Jesus. from nike because they were protecting their their jordan ip and i'll never forget at the time we left i left lotto and i went to work at oliver peoples because i got offered the brand director job and yep. it was a lot of money and i had it just had benny so i needed some money so I was doing gourmet and then, sorry, I was moonlighting at gourmet, but at Oliver Peoples and the process server, I don't know if you've ever been served a lawsuit, but the process server has to serve you the lawsuit. They got to find you. Like the actual person. There's like a dude from the law firm that ha his job is to go find the guy mm -hmm. and it's like, you've been served. Mm -hmm. So, so they have to like touch, put it in your hand or something, right? Yep. So I'll never forget, I'm at the gourmet office, which was strategically placed 50 feet from the Oliver Peoples office. <laughs> and... This guy would come by the office like, is John Buscemi here? And like the receptionist was like, no, nah, he's not here right now. Um, but you can leave a message. And I was just like, 
some like law firm was like looking i was like we knew it i was like talking like dude we're getting fucking sued by nike dude oh and you just knew and i don't know if you remember it was one of the best parts of the story we fucking dumbasses (laughs) our dumbasses you know what we named the shoes the cease and the desisto that's what we (laughs) named i didn't remember that because you just the knew. Name so of the you shoe. knew you were we taunting. knew yeah 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 we <laughs> knew it and we named it that just because we knew it and we were just we were just kind of just didn't give a fuck at the time because it was like a hobby brand yeah yeah even though we had some aspirations for it i think deep down inside we all knew like you know greg owned hall of fame and yeah. lucci was doing other things for adidas like we all had checks coming in so it was just like whatever mm-hmm. so we named it the season desist this process server kind of just finally found me i get this lawsuit and i was just like here it is, guys. Yeah. Literally like a book. Nike was protecting their Jordan IP, which is like, dude, now as I own my own brand, I fucking get it. Yeah. You got to do it. And funniest thing is we go up to Nike. And I'll make the, this is such a long story. I got to cut it a little bit. Uh-huh. Nike had a sales rep in New York City uh-huh. that went into Dave's Quality Meets. And this is not on like this is a this is kind of like a Nike employee, but he wasn't like this is what Nike was totally clear, free and clear of everything. Yep. But this employee went into the store and said, "If you keep selling these gourmet shoes, we're going to close your Nike account. That's called antitrust. That's a huge, huge fucking red flag. Really huge. So my lawyer, who is my brother-in-law, while we're in this lawsuit and we're going back and forth, was like, "This is a gift from God, guys." How did you find that out? Because Chris, who owned Dave Quality Meat, called us and said, some Nike guy came in here and threatened me, you guys got to get your fucking shoes out of here, bro. Yeah. They're gonna, I'm going to lose millions of dollars in business because you idiots. And we're like, whoa, 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 wait. <laughs> this is, hold on a second. So I called my brother and he's like, that's antitrust. H- have him write down in the email what happened. Yeah. Took his email, made it an affidavit, sent it to Nike and said, we're countersuing you. A literally an hour or two hours later, email from Nike, come up to come up to Portland. We go to Portland, we sit down, they think we're like they think we're like like East African like bootleggers from like the fucking like midtown Manhattan selling yeah. fake North Face and Timberlands. Yeah. We show up, we're all wearing Nike, we're all like <laughs> kids from the East Coast that yeah. fucking get it. We're si- literally we're walking down the the pathway to yeah. go to our meeting and we see people we know <laughs> in front of their lawyers. Yeah. They're like, it's like the scene in The Godfather where, uh, you know, the, Michael brings uh, uh, um, Pantangeli's brother from fucking Italy and is like, uh, I got a signed affidavit. Like, this is, what, what's happening here? Yeah. And they're like, wait a minute. We get into the room and literally the meeting completely stops and they're like, wait a minute, okay. Tell us everything. And we're like, yeah, we're paying homage to Jordan. We fucking completely ripped you off. But we did it as a homage. And we did it because it was something dope to do. And we're not trying to, like, bootleg the Jordan. We're just trying to make something dope. And they were like, okay, cool. Done. Meeting over. Sell the rest of the shoes. Just promise you won't make them anymore so we don't have to keep suing you. We're like, cool. Wow. Done. I, meeting they, over and they let you sell the rest they let us they were so nice man that's great nike was so amazing through the process they were like we totally get it now yeah. we, we're not going to collaborate with you like this totally doesn't make sense to us but the funny thing is a year later that shoe came out and then like at jordan and uh-huh, like you saw uh-huh. you saw them doing that later which was really fucking flattering you know yeah. what i mean because yeah. we're such big fans of like that whole thing and everything's kind of a copy anyway you know what i mean really like no one's reinventing like we're not going to be wearing fucking like floating fucking jackets and fucking like it's just like we're not gonna be wearing like like sneakers or sneakers like you gotta like i mean there's some new things that come out there you're like oh shit but at the end of the day it's kind of a derivative of something else yeah everyone's recycling i just that's amazing how that played out because i remember i thought i remember like nino or someone telling me like yeah nike sued him or something but i was i don't know that was a long time ago and i didn't remember whatever happened right and That's that was great. it. That was the, that was kind of the thing. And then, uh, you know, having a you know, we had a couple million dollar business off of those shoes mm-hmm. that were the kind of the theirs. Mm-hmm. So, fuck, we were in a we were we were kind of fucked yeah. because we couldn't you know we couldn't do those shoes again, and we weren't making apparel anymore because it was it wasn't the right time. So then we started doing like ground up 
like original designs, mm-hmm. hybrids for a gourmet, and that kind of lasted a few years. Yeah. And uh, I have a, and I think there's a lot of a lot of people out there that have a problem being too early. Yeah. I've been like Captain Early, like hey Captain Early. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of guys that I know, designers that are like. Yeah, that's dope, but like, I don't know if anyone's really gonna feel that right now. Yeah. And then, like, you wake up two years later, it's like everything that's happened for sure, especially in the design world. I yeah. feel like that's so common. And those, it's like, it's like, it kind of even music it happens too. It's like, yeah, I was doing True. that, but yeah, but you didn't do it at the right time. Yep. So that kind of was a a big issue for us. We've always early on stuff, and and that doesn't help, you know. Yeah. And then, uh, uh. You know, gourmet was kind of coming to an end for me. It just uh, we 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 had ideas, and you know, I don't want to talk shit about anyone, but you know, co- art and commerce sometimes don't mix. Yep. And you know, our partners, the money guys, didn't understand what we were doing, kind of like quote unquote art wise or yep. creatively, and they were like, you know, the business was kind of failing, and also at the same time, you have Vans Vault coming out and fucking this brand coming out. So like being early on this like lifestyle streetwear footwear yep. was great until like van starts to be your competition For sure. and then creative recreation and you know uh whatever other cole han whether everyone was in nike like everyone started jump like everyone in the, uh, adidas everyone was in the pool yep. it's like i can't compete with you yeah I'm so not- you could just feel it coming to an end so i we felt it well you feel it coming to an end when you don't have a paycheck sure. so um a long time before uh, it was probably right when Gourmet started, like 2009, mm-hmm. I had an idea um, to do, I've always, you know, I'm like the guy that's always the, I'm the idea guy. I have like all these things going on in my head. And in 2009, I really fell in, a, fell in love with this brand called Camper. Mm-hmm. It's a Spanish brand. They're vertically integrated. Like they own the factory and they own the retail store. So they make the shoes like they come up with the idea for the shoes and then they sell them in their own store. There's no middleman, there's no wholesale. Yep. There's nothing. They just they're a vertically integrated fucking company. Yep. I always loved that idea and we couldn't do it with Gourmet cuz we had so many wholesale accounts, but I wrote a business plan and kind of was like toying around with this idea of doing a brand like a a footwear brand out of one location. Mm-hmm. And this is only where you can get it and like at the Grove or something, yep. or something like that. Yeah. And it just sat on my on my computer, and Gourmet's coming to an end, and I was like, this is what I'm feeling. I think we should do this. Mm-hmm. And my friend Ryan Babenzine, who was, at the time, he was at Puma, he was the head of their celebrity marketing, was at my office, and I was like, dude, you know when you're, you know when you're leaving a job, you're, you, you're like, misery loves company. I'm like, dude, I, I don't know what I'm gonna do. Fucking, this shit sucks. I got a family. That's what I was gonna I ask you. I got no money. I just wanted to ask you if you yeah. and that. I mean, you just answered it, but like, because I've I've known a little bit of your story and I knew that part of it. And like, it's amazing to me that you went on to have really big success on the next thing. And right. that like, I wondered if that hurt your spirit at all for a moment, like the end of gourmet. Yeah, that it was. Like, I was done, man. I was I was not done, but I was like, it was really. It was like we had the shot, we had the press, we had the notoriety, but we didn't have the revenue and we didn't have the team. Yep. You know, and that was really depressing. So there was a couple things happening. One, I was thinking about doing the. There was two things. Okay, I have a really great family that would support me, and I have, you know, uh, I got through it. You know, Maria was working. You know, you know, and and we kind of got through the hard financial time. We kind of like cut all expenses and yeah. like you know like stop the bleeding. Yeah. So it gave me some time to think. One was this old business plan of like, hey why don't we start a footwear company? And I was meeting with Ryan. He was kind of over Puma. I was like, hey, remember when we were talking about this thing? Like fucking, we were, we were talking about it like years ago when I wrote, I wrote a kind of like a small kind of like plan. Yeah. He's like, bro, it's time now. Have you heard of this company called Warby Parker? And I'm like, nah, what the fuck is that? He's like, well, now everyone knows what it is. But yeah. back in 2012, it was like, nah, what is it? He's like, well, it's this brand of 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 eyewear. And they like, they only have a website, they don't have a store, and like you go on the website and you like try on five pairs of, sh- of, of glasses, they send them to your house, and yeah. you pick one and you get, and they, and they buy it. And you get, it's only online, it's only online, it's only online. <laughs> and like we didn't really, we had an e-commerce, but we didn't fucking sell one pair of shoe, shoes a day. It was yeah. like, back in 2012 was really, I feel like, right 
when things were kind of like happening for quote unquote everyone saying direct consumer now but that's when it started yep. and he's like why don't we just make these shoes and sell them on a website yeah. i'm like all right cool that sounds cool so you kind of re, re revamp the business plan i'm like well you can you you have to like go raise the money for this i don't know i i have no money yeah. he's like don't worry about that let's just write the business plan it took us about three or four months to write the business plan at the same time I'm in my sulking in my gourmet office, uh -huh, uh -huh. and this guy Rob Hepler walks into my office. Yep. Do you know Rob? I sure do. Okay, so Rob Hepler, who I've known, I didn't really know him like as a friend, yeah. but I knew him because he had the show with Frank the Butcher. I, what the fuck's the name? He had a, he had a fucking wow. He had a podcast before everyone had a podcast. Yeah, he did. I don't remember what it's called. I forgot the name of it, but uh, um, Rob walks into my office and he's like, "Hey." What's up? Oh, no, 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 sorry, rewind. I saw him at Agenda, kind of reconnected with him. I might have met him like once before. He came into the to the gourmet booth. What's up? We should hook up. I'm, in, I'm living in LA. I'm working at an advertising agency. Cool, whatever, come by. Yep. Came by the office and he had, he had this idea to do this sneaker. Mm -hmm. And he shows me this design and I literally, I probably turned white and fell off my chair because I fucking literally have the exact same design years ago, uh -huh. even though it was years ago, it doesn't matter. It was sitting on my fucking folder in my computer, had the same exact design of this sneaker. It was this luxury kind of sneaker take on the Birkin bag. Yep. Was, was his like, based on the Birkin bag too? Yes, his was, ex it Amazing. was basically, mine, mine was taking the same idea for a Birkin bag and doing it, and his was the same, but it totally, they looked totally different, it was yeah. the same idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got and it. it was just like, like that scene in that movie like did we just become best friends like kind of <laughs> yeah, vibe like oh my god step brothers yeah, yeah. yeah it was like whoa so it was just like it was an instant fucking magnet connectivity it was like let's do this yeah and then it turned into well i don't have any money and then it was like well my girlfriend has a couple bucks maybe she'll do it she said no and then he was like let me f talk to a friend of mine and uh he brings dan weissman Mm -hmm. into the office and dan was super excited about it i was like yeah let's do it and dan was like i'll fund it but i want this amount i was like no nah, that doesn't really make sense for me yeah so it kind of just sat around for a bit and it just was like nothing i was gonna actually do it with the crooks yeah yeah that's funny they were gonna do the shoe imagine that path. and check this out this is the best part of the story like it was gonna be a crook shoe yeah it was like i thought the it would be cool for the crooks to do yeah but it was too expensive and they were like not they, they were kind of interested in it and then it just you know how conversations go. It was not a bad thing. It's just like didn't go anywhere. No, no, yeah, of course. Just imagine that route. If it went that route, it could have been crazy. Right? It yeah. could have been in a. I mean, I don't know what it could have happened. But this is the crazy. The craziest route is, I'm sitting at a dinner with Nino, mm -hmm. and Nino's like, Pharrell wants to bring ice cream sneakers back. I'm like, okay, <laughs> so bring it back. Yeah. He's like, no, he wants to meet with like you guys because. At the time, we owned the LRG footwear license, uh -huh. and we did gourmet, and he was like, you know, he wants to meet with you guys. So me and Luch go to the studio. I'll never forget. We get to the studio. It's like like Miley Cyrus is like hugging me, and like Jennifer Hudson's walking out of one room. We're like, uh, okay, <laughs> this is universe. weird. Yeah. And then like Pharrell walks in. He's like, what's up, guys? Let's talk. So we're like kind of going through. We kind of put a PDF together, kind of just so we were a little organized, like this is gourmet. He already knew. This is what we do. He already knew. Yeah. We do LRG. Oh, cool. I didn't see this. Cool design. Because actually, the LRG shoes we did were banging. They really? just didn't fucking no market for them. Well, I mean, I'm not trying to talk shit, but like the the brass at LRG, yeah. they were like very like, no, I don't like that. Yeah. Like, yeah, you should not be saying anything. You should just let me make everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Kind of vibe. <laughs> yep. And then it was just like we were completely turned off, and it was just like. We made a few things, th a few things came out, whatever. And that, it was kind of when they were just, it was right after Jonas. It was a weird time. Yeah, yeah. So we're sitting there in the meeting and I'm, do you know what a hot corner is? No. You know, like on a computer, on your Apple. If oh, you, like, you go into you it, pull it your mouse and it goes like this, right? Got it, yeah. So, so, so Pharrell asked like, hey, let me see some, let me see that or something. And I go on the hot corner because I'm like kind of controlling the screen through the presentation. And I click on Illustrator, and the the Birkin bag shoe comes up on his computer. On my computer, okay. Because I'm doing okay. the PDF presentation. <laughs> I've never seen a human being like 
bro, he gets up, like grabs his hat, like we've been in this motherfucking meeting for over an hour, and you show me this now? <laughs> what the fuck is that? <laughs> Literally, crazy. The whole room stops. Greg's like, "Why the fuck are you showing your side project?" And it was a mistake. Yeah, I would. I didn't plan it. Like, yeah. look, maybe it would be smart to plan it. One hundred percent. I didn't plan it. Yep. Right. So. Yo, meeting basically over at that moment. Like, everyone can leave. Let's just talk about this. And I'm like, bro, this is a side project I'm doing. I'm not even doing – actually, I don't even know what I'm doing with this thing. Yeah. It was called the $100 million because mm -hmm. the at the time, Louis Vuitton had a, a friend that called the million dollar. Yep. No, called the – Millionaire, right? Millionaire. Yeah. So I called this shoe – I wrote literally on the tongue it said – Dollar sign one zero zero comma zero 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 comma zero zero zero. That was the name of the shoe. Uh -huh. Hundred million, <laughs> just as an idea, and it was just like, what is this? I'm like, I don't know what it is. A friend of mine and I both had the idea at the same time. I'm just refining mine because actually I was going to meet back up with Rob and kind of refine it and yep. maybe meet with the crooks, maybe meet with fucking. We were kind of trying to like give it to someone because we couldn't afford it. Yep. We couldn't afford to make it. Yeah. So. Meeting over, full on argument, like in the parking lot with like my partners, like about dude, why you did, like that. fuck, dude, guy, what are you like fucked up, man? Yeah. Like what? Why did you do that? Yeah. I was like, it was a mistake. Yeah. I think they believed me. Like once they calmed down, they knew that I wasn't there. I didn't. I had no business doing anything with him. Yep. But that's not what happened after that. Mm -hmm. My phone starts ringing literally that night, like Pharrell's management or whatever. Yo. You guys need to meet back up. Like he needs to see that you need. Like what do you like? Let's talk more. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, I'll give you guys the benefit of the doubt. Uh -huh. So I went down to my partners in San Diego and I presented this shoe. I said, this is this shoe. This is what we're. This shoe needs to be made in Italy. It needs to have 18 karat gold hardware on it. It needs to have hand painted edges just like the bag. Yep. It needs to have a liner that's faceted leather just like the bag. It needs to come in a box just like the bag. It needs to have a dust label. It's going to cost two hundred dollars a pair to make. Uh -huh. That's it. It's gonna be an $800 shoe. You wanna do it? Very, very strong no. Uh -huh. And these strong are the same guys no. that finance Gourmet. And my partners okay. who, my no, no, my partners wanted to put this as in our line. And I said, you know what? If they wanna do it, I feel really strongly about this shoe. Mm -hmm. Let's do it. Yeah. Strong no. Yeah. Okay. That was literally my last day at Gourmet. I came back to LA. I called my brother-in-law and I said, Okay, here's the play. We're gonna do this with Pharrell. It's gonna be a collaboration with Pharrell and John Buscemi, uh -huh. the man, the person. Uh -huh. And that was my pitch. I went to Pharrell and he was like, cool, I get it, cool. Make a sample. I make a sample, the sample comes in. It was almost like that fucking, the, the Pulp Fiction moment when you open the box. It was like, the, the fucking, the, the sample came from Italy it was just like, yeah, yeah. No, you could feel the energy in the so room. It was, yeah, I couldn't tell if you were going to say was it was good or bad. Oh, good energy. Yeah, yeah. Like, amazing. It was like, holy shit, bro. And, yeah. like, me and Rob went to meet with Pharrell a couple times. And I've told this story on on, on the, my, the Complex podcast. Mm -hmm. But. Never heard of it. It's all right. I'll tell it here. I'll tell you. you, you you're, <laughs> we'll tell your peoples. No. So, so the timeline with Pharrell was interesting because when I first met with him four months before, uh -huh. the, 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 the Daft Punk song was on the radio. Uh -huh. And then it was just like, click. Yeah. That was right. Is that right when Pharrell started getting super hot again? Okay. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> Alan Thicke songs on the radio. Yeah. I mean, Robin Thicke. Alan Thicke. Shout yeah. out to Alan yeah. Thicke. Yeah. Did he Rest in peace. Yeah. Rest in peace. Yep. Rest in peace. Robin Thicke. Now it's hot. It's hot. Yeah. It's lit. It's almost like uh, NBA Jam, the second mm -hmm. shot. He's heating up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then that happy <laughs> drop, bro. Happy it dropped. Happened. Happy fucking drop. Happy was it. So happy the, was Our last meeting with, with Pharrell, Happy's on the radio for a couple of weeks, and it's just like, this is a different environment. Yep. God bless Pharrell. I have tons of fucking respect and love for him. But it was basically... It changed where, not a bad thing, it just made more sense for him. He wanted the shoe for his line. Yep. It didn't. It went from John Buscemi times Pharrell to like, this is going to be Pharrell's shoe. Yeah. So I basically said, bro, 
it's been nice, cool, like like being around this, like God bless. Yeah. Peace. So I walked away from why like, did you have the presence of my, like why? Because of I don't there's a few times you feel something, man. Yeah. Like I felt it and then when you go to like show this shoe to like very like maybe in your text messaging some of the most influential people in the world that are like I want a thousand pairs. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like you just and knew. I knew it. Yeah. And I'm not gonna say the number, but we wrote a small contract and sent it over to his camp and said, if you give us this amount of money, the shoe's yours. Yeah. And it was over a million dollars for just, just we threw it out there. It was like, I don't know, a couple million bucks. You can have it for two million bucks. Yeah. And they were like, ha, 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 that's funny. And which is, which is I would say the same thing. If yeah. I'm in this vision, like, yeah, that's funny, guys. For sure, yeah. But to this date, I mean, that shoe's probably clocked like, that's a single shoe alone's 50 million. Yeah. Just on that shoe. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it's amazing. But to have the you know what I'm anyone, saying? anyone, yeah. especially at happy Pharrell time frame, would have given him whatever he wanted and said, This is my ticket. That's right. And that thing could have just got lost. If you would have done that, as you know very yeah, because, well. Yeah, because because yeah, because I've known well, also, I'm the I'd have to produce it. Mm -hmm. Like if it was like like a Kanye situation. Yeah. And like Adidas was sure. doing it, then yeah. then it would be different. If 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 Pharrell said, "Let's do this with Adidas. We'll make an eight hundred dollars shoe through Adidas, and we'll open it to these stores, yeah. and like your name will be on it." Da 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 da. Yeah. That's different. I'd have to produce it, it, and I was like, "Dude, I had nothing going on, bro. Yeah. I, I'm I'm leaving that, I'm leaving that meeting with no money for gas." Yeah, yeah. Seriously. Yeah. Damn it, man. So, um, Gourmet says no. Me and Rob can't get anyone to kind of agree to it. And I I kind of just had a weekend alone to myself and I said, I'm starting a brand called Buscemi. Mm -hmm. And I put together this thing as a story. So it wasn't even really a brand. It was more like like a designer doing an art project because I only six things, it was only six things. It was a shoe, it was a bag, it was a dog leash, it was a coffee sleeve made out of leather with a gold handle, it was a leather tie and it was a, um, a wallet yeah. and it was like the shoe and the shoe and it was like kind of presented as like what's the dopest dude the flyest dude you know what would be at his house yeah. that was kind of like the brief and was it all designed around the shoe right so the shoe was the, the obviously i'm a shoe person so that was the focus point but it was like mm -hmm. you know what else does this guy yep. quote unquote have in his house like the bag the wallet the dope fucking you know the leather dog leash and the coffee sleeve and stuff so that was the the idea and i showed it in paris um and how know. did you even like you showed it in paris just as a concept still no funding At, right no funding no sorry let me rewind my brother-in-law and a few people that i knew close to me funded the samples got it that's it yep and a few hundred pairs and we went to uh uh deirdre and minya my friends on this show called the capsule show it's kind of like a big fashion kind of sale it's like yep. a it's like a trade show but more curated and i showed there i sat at this booth and every, you know i have people i already know people in the industry they're like oh shit this is sick yeah. but the crazy part is like the best buyers in the world came by and they were like okay how many can i order yeah. and it like yeah this these other little accessories are nice but i want the shoes yeah and then it was just like wow we just opened the best six stores on the planet yeah and we, i came back to la and i'm like all right let's see what happens let's all hold our hands yeah and due to social media this is, I mean, if you really remember, I mean, I don't know if there's a timeline. Someone should write one. Like 2013 is like, I mean, that's when Instagram, you'd still get 3,000 likes on a photo and you had 6,000 friends. Yep. Like 100%. That, those days are over. You yes, know what I mean? Over. This is when like visibility on social media was lot, like not hidden by an algorithm yep. or yep. like you didn't have to game the system. That was, was the like, heyday. I was on the popular I page was pop every day. Yeah, I made the popular page with yeah. that shoe. Yep. And that was like, and then it was like, why is Puffy like posting this shoe four times on his like main page? Bieber, uh, football players in, in in London and in Spain, like. It and was, was that like, type of shit? It just was like, oh my god! But was that happening without you sending it to Zero, each of them? Not one. Oh. I didn't send one motherfucking shoe out. That was like that is magic. That's them going to stores I, and buying I, it and I bought it. It just it. turned. It went to. It, I mean, it's an anomaly. It's an enigma, man. It yeah. just doesn't happen that. And it was one thing. Yeah. 
That's all I had. And then it was like, whoa. And then it was like, okay, six stores turned into 60 stores and 300 pairs turned into 30,000 pairs. Uh-huh. And, you know, then it's like, which department store do you want? You have your pick. Yeah. You can go in with any of them. Yeah. And then it's like, uh, okay, Neiman Marcus, you know, it's one of our best accounts. And, you know, now and we're in all, every door. You yeah. know, it's like, it was a wild time, you know, going from, you know, from zero to, you know, around $30 million in business in less than two years. Yeah. Insane. Insane. I remember. I mean, that shoe was like, I'm trying to th- compare it to something. I mean, it's like, Louboutin, it's, I think Christian Louboutin yeah, has the same kind of. It is, but it's like how the Yeezys feel. It's like how the Red Bottoms feel. It's like it's something that was an item, and it was its own thing. Like that's what's so crazy about it. Like you said, it wasn't part of something else. It wasn't right. a hot uh, Louboutin shoe or something right. like that. It was which its was own. already hot for women. You know, they yeah. already had a brand for twenty years. Yeah, yeah, but man, it was, and it was just like you couldn't look at an Instagram page without a celebrity posting it. Yeah, it was crazy that. That was super crazy. Yeah. And then, um, you know, we, we, we really broke, we broke records, man. We, 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 we broke, we broke a lot of records. And then, uh, did it change your personal, how people treated you? For sure. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I'd like to say that I've been pretty seasoned in this business and people that, um, people that I, People that I respected and worked with before in other situations that were buying the shoes, nothing really changed. Yeah, it was just, I think people were really happy for me because they yeah. knew that I put it in. Yeah, they knew that I've been building up to something really great, and I, I've, I haven't gotten any like, fuck that dude. You know what yeah. I mean? I haven't heard any of that. It's yeah. been like, but do you have like you Justin Bieber? Because there's people, people that I know a lot of people that haven't put it in that have, have are more successful than me oh, that I sure. have a problem with. For some, sure, some people. For you sure, know what I mean like. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, but I'm. I, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I get that way now. Now that I've been in it, like for this, you know, like ten years. Yeah, I start to feel myself feeling that way, and I'm like, damn, that's how everyone felt when I started. Like I was that guy. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I don't. Not so much, but maybe you feel that way. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, well, more what I meant was like, do you have, like, did you have like Bieber stylist calling you, and like, are you like now this? We had Bieber at the office. Man, uh, he was there. It was the, that's the crazy part. And you have like two chains. Oh, like, for, it for was, sure the stylist. <laughs> yeah, man, for sure the style. The stylists were like, we were like, for a minute we were like, nah. Yeah, you got to buy it. Yeah, but then it was like, nah, man. The guy already has ten pairs. You yeah. got to fucking give one to the stylist yeah, for the video. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, and it turned into that. And then I remember, Toronto has a really sick store called Serpentine, mm-hmm. which is like their. I guess Maxfield's equivalent or got like it. Union, mm-hmm. and uh, I get a call from the guys from Serpentine, literally right to my phone. Justin's here; he wants to buy all the shoes. What do you want us to do? And I said, "You got to sell it to him, man. It's fucking, it's a free world, man. Yeah. Sell him all the shoes." Yeah. And he literally was there with seven guys, and he bought like ten pairs of shoes. And then it showed up on, you know, and then, you know, I never forget. I'm in my car, and he called me. And my son's like, you know, my son's like five years old. And yeah. Justin Bieber's on the Bluetooth. It's like, it was pretty fucking crazy for him. Yeah. But I, you know, I saw Justin during Fashion Week in New York. He's a good kid. Yeah. Yeah. I know Haley. And it just has to feel, shoes. I don't know. I, to me, it's like, it, it must be the designer equivalent of just having this smash record That's, for a musician. Right? I think so. It's like you've been designing and been involved in that world your whole, you know, adult life. And you just get this smash. And now, every, you know what I mean? I felt that. Yeah. I mean, and also, you know, I still get recognized in the airport, so that's a good thing. You do? Oh, yeah. That's oh. so good. I mean, you are like, at this Yo. point now, you're like a... Because also... Sh- you show me. I'm like TSA guy, like... That's incredible. Because here's the other thing. Because sneakers like, have... Yeah. I love that sneakers transcend like all, like... Yeah, but all, also... All walks of life, you know what I mean? They 100% Shoes do. Shoes are very important. And this culture of like streetwear, especially luxury streetwear, is fashion now right like that's men's fashion week it's right. all these big streetwear what, guys the story we've been telling and my whole my my entire life story now is at the you yeah know, at exactly yeah you know what i mean like virgil what virgil's done completely like anomaly amazing but that's part of our story man. it's a We're result skated, of all of that we love yeah. this hip-hop we love this new wave song we we went to that 
art show. We we knew that fucking trick on a skateboard. Yeah. Like all that shit. It's great to see that that is ruling the world in, yeah. in a weird way. Okay, so let me ask you this. Uh, you got the opportunity to, did you sell a portion? Did you sell half? Yeah, we sold uh, We sold more than half of the company mm -hmm. at this point um, in a few different transactions. But the idea was when you have a company with this kind of like, like hockey stick or fucking explosive yep. like growth, trajectory yeah you need help yeah i needed a lot of help and you know we we partnered with lion capital because they're like the experts when it comes to like consumer products one but also you know they bought jimmy chew and sold it yep. you know they own john varvados um they've been really helpful now they they own a lot of you know uh, they own a lot of brands that also have stakes yep. right in in a certain area that need help on retail and they're really they're they they're experts when it comes to like retail and that's something that we're diving into now we have a few stores we have one in new york we have one in toronto we're looking to do one maybe in atlanta miami or la or all three of them in in different order but my brand's going to live at small format luxury retail that's kind mm -hmm. of like our vision mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. so in general that like doing you did that at the right time and that relationship has been good absolutely yeah I have nothing but good things to say. You know, you hear, I think you hear horror stories about private equity and, and uh, uh, PE or uh, VCs um, coming into brands. But I think now in this day and age, there's, there's companies like Lion or Lion that are they're, they're, they're experts when mm -hmm. it comes to certain aspect of the business. Mm -hmm. And that's the only reason we partnered. For but sure. I'm sure there's a lot of like, nightmare stories out there but i got lucky yeah that's why i think your that part of your story is so important because number one i think that you know we used to look at it as like um taking investments and that stuff was like selling out i don't think the industry really thinks of it that way like that anymore i don't think consumers really care as long as like you're still there the product's still yeah. good like i don't think they care like like they used to also you hear nightmare stories about doing those deals and it's like oh i lost control or they just went crazy with it or whatever the other big thing that i want to mention is a lot of times you hear these stories of people having really quick explosion of success and they think they're invincible and can do it forever. And we have we know a lot of people that have rolled that man. right back down. Oh yeah. And you you just you did it at the perfect time. I think so, yeah. And I think also at the same time, there's a bit of like I mean, you're scared. You get scared, man. Yeah. It's not just like, oh, I saw I mean, I can we can name a hundred people that like Oh shit! You had this big business and now it's nothing. You should have sold it, bro. Yeah, should have sold it, bro. Yeah. First of all, you can't time anything. Yeah. We we're in, in, a, in a unique situation where, absolutely, maybe it's time to take some money off the table. But it was more about let's get in bed with someone that like understands where we're at as a business and can help us grow it. Yeah. You know, the business is not far off from where it was when they bought the company. Um, it's in a we're in a different space when it comes to luxury streetwear, yeah. where I was a little bit, like I called you captain early. Yeah. So it's gonna take a little bit of time to level off and then now we have plans, you know, with partnerships in Asia and partnerships in South America and like big boy plans yeah. where we couldn't, if I held on to the company, maintain the revenue or not, yeah. doesn't mean I can like have a company for fucking 100 yeah. years. And so, it's just a fact of like where we come from is like we- We're it, just piecing it, dude, we were just like, bro. Yeah. We're just I'm broke, going for I'm bro it. Man. I'm broke with Rob Hepler in a fucking office. Yep. And then I have like a fucking like nine figure like revenue in like two years. Yeah. Like like bro, it was too fast. Yep. So we needed the help, you know? No, it's great. I, and that's always the disconnect, right? It's like those guys don't know how to create a brand like Buscemi. And we don't know how to fucking do some global retail play, right? Like we're just no some way. skater dudes. Yeah, exactly. Like, I'm just some <laughs> guy with a good idea. Yeah. And I know a few friends that helped me along the way you know shout out to everybody yeah, yeah. Uh, okay so then then let's get into like real quick what you're doing now because we talked a little bit before we started recording but now like you're really in my opinion just my perception you're like on the other side of the success in terms of now you're have partners with Buscemi taking that to the next level you have investments mm -hmm. you have a truffle hot sauce that's mm. exploding oh yeah you have new businesses you're working on. Mm. Like, 
you're really like it's almost like before you were working at gourmet on the side while working at Oliver Peoples or whatever, trying to just piece it together. That's right. Now you're like working at your company with Lion Cat, with your partners while you're investing. Like you're the grown man version of of the old. Or I'm the ver- I'm the best version of of what I wanted to be. I yeah. think. Yeah. You know what I mean? You are, man. And I that's think really so, man. Cool. I think so. Yeah. It was. It's. I. I mean, I'm really. I always say it all the time. I'm really lucky. You know what I mean? I've been. I, I've been the idea guy that got lucky. Like I had the smash hit, like yeah, you said. Yeah. But. I threw it back. I threw it all back on the table, man. And I have, you know, well, first of all, I'm the founder of Greats, mm-hmm. and I am active in Greats from a, you know, a light, a light activity. Yep. You know, um, I'm Tell not the active what in the Greats business. Is Greats, Greats is a a a a brand that we started um, in 2012 that I talked about a little bit before. But Greats is a direct to consumer footwear company based in Brooklyn that does uh, kind of like the disruptive luxury sneaker play, which makes like the highest quality, really great shoes for men and women um, at a value proposition, right? Yep. So you're not paying full, you know, full retail markup because you can only buy it on this website. So that's great. Um, I also, with a few friends, uh, started a hot sauce company called Truff. Truff is probably the fastest growing condiment in the world right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, and really we, good. Really good. We need another promo box okay, over here. I got, we just rip over. through it. Oh, oh, you need a case. Yeah. Guys, send this Whatever guy a case. Whatever we can get. Um, Truff is an idea um, born from a few guys, uh, Nick and Nick, who one of them is the son of my ex CEO from Buscemi. They had the, they own sauce as the handle. Mm hmm. On Instagram. On Instagram and Facebook. And they, a couple of young guys, maybe they were 19 or 20 or 20 and 21, and they had this handle and they just kind of like put up photos and like, like, you know, in Instagram porn, I call it, you know, like cars and girls and like food and all like, like really well shot, like cool photos and stuff. And just having at sauce kind of like was like, they, they had thousands and thousands of followers, like literally in months. Yep. And they're like, what the fuck are we going to do with this? We should start a hot sauce. And I was like, that's fucking brilliant. Mm-hmm. And then we all kind of toyed around with it. And these guys came up with uh, the idea to do a luxury hot sauce with black truffle in it. Mm-hmm. Sriracha, chili, black truffle, agave syrup. And they just fucking nailed it. Yeah. And they let me invest. And uh, I'm part, me and Aaron, I brought Aaron Levant in. Yep. Uh, Aaron Levant's a guy who started ComplexCon. Now he owns Network, which is QVC meets Instagram. Or HQ Live almost, right? HQ Live. They're, they're That's what it's called, it. right? HQ Live? Yep. And uh, we all put in a couple bucks. Um, the company's like exploding. They're selling about four or 500 bottles a day online. Yeah. We're, uh, uh, I'll give a little exclusive here. Um, we're in the top 10 Oprah's favorite things this year. And she's going to like talk about it on TV, like in a couple of weeks. Damn. Exclusive. Wow. There you and go. And that's going to explode. All and right. We did a deal exclusive, a deal with Amazon. They're going to be selling this two pack thing for us. I mean, it's going crazy. We yeah. broke records at Dina Deluda, Dean DeLuca, fastest selling condiment like ever. Because what happens is like the influence is now reversed, right? Mm-hmm. Like you don't go to a store and be like, Oh shit. Like, let me try this new, you're you're like marketed to on Instagram and yeah. on the internet. And yeah. it's like, oh, I saw that. Now I go to Dean and DeLuca and I'm like, oh shit, I saw that. Okay. Exactly. Clicks yeah. to bricks. Yep. I yep. think they yep. call it. I like that. I like it too. <laughs> That's man. good. I, yeah. like it too. I bet you do. I fucking like it. Uh, Shout out to Heinz if you're watching. No, I'm just kidding. Is that the buyer? Yeah, that's, that's, that's the target. That's the target buyer. <laughs> yeah. No, um, I've been a big Heinz fan my whole life, right? We all use ketchup, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, we sure do. <laughs> hey, do you know what Heinz is? Anyone? Um, so, I mean, now I'm just guessing is a week. Oh, what's a week look like now? You're stopping by the Buscemi office. You're yeah. wheeling cool. and dealing. You're having fancy lunches and finger skating on the plates. Exactly. Um, <laughs> The, the the week and and the week is about eighty percent Buscemi still. I'm still the creative director. We're launching apparel um, next year. We're doing a, a presentation in Paris during Fashion Week in January. So I'm really focused on the Buscemi thing, doing mm-hmm. the shoes, working with the team. Um, 
I forgot to mention the deli. Shout out to Uncle oh, yeah. Paulie. Yeah. Where's that at? Uncle Paulie's Deli's on 8369 Beverly Boulevard. There you go. Um, in the Beverly Grove section of Los Angeles. Nice. Uh, you know, Paulie's uh, a friend from New York. We're sitting in a backyard a few years ago. You know, you have a couple drinks. You're like, we can't get a good sandwich in this town unless you go to Santa Monica, to Bay Cities. Fuck that. Let's open a deli. And a backyard barbecue idea literally turned into like six months later, like signing a lease and then building a deli out. And now we've been open for about a year and change, year and a half. And I mean, we're killing it. So come come get a sandwich over at the deli. But, yeah, yeah. But a day in my life is, yeah, you wake up to, you know, lots of email addresses and text messages and you just go through it, man. Yeah. You know, um, um, I have a few other things happening. Um, I'm really interested in the cannabis space. I think there's a little bit of a gold rush um, right now, and there's a lot of people like going after it. Yep. I'm like watching the dust settle a bit and working with some really smart people to launch a quote unquote luxury uh, uh, product yep. in that space. Yeah, we need that. I'd love to see how you approach that. Yeah, I'm gonna approach that in a very, very um, elegant way. Yep. I also see um, cannabis retail changing, laws will be changing. Direct to consumer laws will be changing. Delivery laws are changing. New York's going to change. I just see a big opportunity for that. And I, you know, I'm a, you know, a 30 year weed smoker. Yeah. So you know what now that's legal, it's interesting. Yeah, it really is. But I still feel like the one thing that gets me, I'm sure you feel this obviously with your plan, is like it still seems so shitty like all the brands all the packaging all the everything is still such a ghetto rig and it like is a rig, dude. even when you see med men which is like we're the apple store or whatever it doesn't no it doesn't not. look like an apple store no, you're not. it looks yeah. like a nice skate shop right but it's funny shout out to like josh shelton and austin rosen they just did a hall of flowers in sonoma county which is like the the agenda of weed mm -hmm. and it was fucking beautiful man. was it yeah because so there's a there's the like i'm saying like people like me we had to wait for the dust to settle like us you know, fancy people. Yeah. And then there's the the guy who's been selling weed like in 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 like illegally for 20 years that like comes out with his brand. Yep. So that yep. guy needs to stick to the grow yep. and needs to stick to working with people like me and sure. then we'll make it look sexy. For but sure. also if you walk in a liquor store, right? I mean, 50% of the place is a piece of shit, right? Yep. Fireball and fucking whatever. Yeah. And then you have your the nice thing. Yeah. So there's there's room for everybody. I think at the end of the day, the quality too. Uh, there's a, there's a problem with quality yeah. right now because of the supply and demand of and, the actual weed. You mean? Yes. Yeah. Of the weed, and that's a problem. So there's things around that, and there's like whole different farming and, and different different harvesting and different. There's just different ways to do things um, yeah. that I want to be on that side of it. And also the international aspect of it. You know, we, uh, I found a, um, I found a strain um, that's been dated back from the Roman Empire in Italy uh -huh. during one of my travels. A uh -huh. guy that's been growing it in the backyard in Emilia Romagna. Yeah. And I, I'm getting that strain to be brought to California and we're going to grow it here. That's good. Which is some weird, like, high end shit. High end shit. Yeah. It's going to be, pretty cool so yeah there's a whole it's yep. crazy that's that whole scene and then i'm also invested in a company called StockX. i don't mm -hmm. know if anyone knows what that is that's where i got these oh word yeah Went shout out to StockX. consumer StockX, yeah so i'm a consumer as well um josh luber and dan gilbert re reached out to me a few years ago and were like hey we're starting this company do you want to invest in it and i was like um i don't know yeah i didn't really understand I was like, I was interested, but I didn't understand like what they were doing at first. And I was like, you know what? I like you guys. Obviously, Dan Gilbert's a fucking, you know, he's a captain of industry. Yeah. And I'm like, I'll bet on you guys and I'll bet on that this industry is growing. Yep. And, you know, you were right. I was right. So yeah. that's good. I helped them out. I've been to um, I've been to some of their events out in Detroit. You know, I've helped Josh with a few things. I'm I'm very kind of like a strategic advisor. I'm always I have my phone's ready for them at any moment. So yeah. that's a good that's something that I spend some time on. Yeah. And that's I mean, a few other things, but that's pretty much it. Yeah, that seems pretty uh busy. Yeah, I'm pretty busy. But the great thing is like I have a good uh 
a time management um you know so i have i'm pretty good at that so it's like nothing's too overwhelming yeah and then on top of all that you're about to start a podcast that's right so the podcast actually is i'm not really starting a podcast the podcast has been going for decades yeah just no one's been recording <laughs> yeah you know what i mean yeah. you probably feel the same I way do. Right? that's a, we do another show me and the my partners thing, right? the group chat yeah, yeah and that's what that is yeah 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 it's like why is in the it's funny also well i'm not going to talk too much about it but because it's i don't want to get too excited because nothing's signed but yeah. i feel like giving instagram stories away is yeah. like i'm not doing that anymore that's fucking expensive what like, do you mean? Like, like when I'm sitting at a when I'm sitting with a friend yeah. at a meal in a certain part of the world, yeah. and I'm giving you that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not trying to say I'm selfish, but yeah. I'm saying I would like to have that produced a little bit better. Yeah, and maybe you pay for it. Yeah, AKA doing a show on TV. Yeah. So I get that. I'm 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 currently lightly trying to develop something where you can like. S- come on a journey with me yeah. and it's produced in a, cause sometimes you're like, Oh shit, I'm at, this is the best fucking dinner I ever had. And I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm capturing it with my like bad fucking yeah. Instagram prowess. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? I almost feel like we're going to go through a phase where everyone's just Instagram story. Everything's low quality. Fuck it. It's about quantity, not quality, blah, blah, blah. And then it's going to come out of that a little bit when it comes to content. Like I do think people will start to, like they're gonna invent a drone that can shoot a TV show for you. Yeah, or they'll, they'll, like they'll just, just turn that run. drone on. He'll he'll film everything for you. I think the appetite for well done curated content will sort of come back. Right now, it's just about like feed me, feed me, feed me. Yeah, me. Yeah. I get a little I get a little annoyed where some of like it's like almost the don't meet your idols. You know that yep. uh, that sure do. that term. Yep. It's like really, dude. I fucking loved you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And yeah. now you have Instagram stories. Yeah. I fucking hate that you. That is now. true. I've been you are the that. worst person yep. ever. I've seen that. Um, yeah. Yeah, so yeah I feel you, thing. man. Let me ask you, I just want to ask you this one last sort of advice question because your story ties heavily into this question that I get a lot, which is you went multiple times from having a normal job, well, not normal ever, but having a job, having a secure paycheck, especially the one at DC, for instance. Like, yeah. it's a fun job. It's a, probably decent money. Like, great. But you still had that hunger to go do something on your own. I think a lot of people have that hunger. I think a lot of people don't know how to do it. But more importantly, don't know when is the right time or are too scared to ever make that move. And you kind of always just live in that like little bit of bitterness, right? Yep. My question is, when do you know it's the right time? When do you, how do you take the leap? How do you do that? Right. So I've been asked this question before and I've, I can answer it a couple different ways, but I think I'll answer it both ways. Mm-hmm. The first, the first, it depends on what situation you're in. If you have, if you have a dying and a, and a burning desire to do this over here, mm-hmm. right? Uh, you want to make furniture, okay? But you work at a bank. Yeah. You have to work so hard on that furniture on your off time to make it something that's going to be something yeah. before you leave that bank. I think what people think are you know, in my case was a little bit different because the, the way I'll answer it is I went into an industry that I now I'm still in, yep. right? So I worked at DC and I worked in a shoe company, quote unquote. Yep. My advice to that person, if you are at, a, are at a shoe company and you want to start a shoe company, suck that place dry of every contact, every information, get your PhD in what you're doing, which I did at DC, I think. Yep. And if you have hustled in the past and understand how a small business works and you watch Shark Tank 40 times, (laughs) that's good. Then go leave. But make sure you got all your information first. But if you're the guy that's at DC Shoes and you want to do a weed brand, I'd say quit immediately and go work at a big weed brand for for very little money. And I think the advice I'm trying to say is, don't leave until you know how to do everything in a small business. Yeah. The sales, the logistics, answering the phone. Uh, we did it all. And that's, I think that's, that's the point is don't leave before you know every job on a small business level that you're going to need to know yeah. and be able to. I think that's, the, that's why people get scared. You get scared because you're ignorant. And so, you get scared because of, I'm usually scared when I don't know something. Exactly. 
if you don't, but now I'm like, okay, I can design shoes. I can sell them. I can answer the phone. I know how to call a third party warehouse and someone can ship them for me. Yeah. I can pack a box. I can go to fucking UPS myself. You know, I know a couple people at Hypebeast. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. like if you know, I know how to take a picture on my phone. Yeah. If you know a few people then, but you know, and, and also I, I think skateboarding comes into it and like that like stockbroker in me where having a little bit of the crazy, like I'm gonna try and make this trick. I'm gonna try and make this trick. Yeah. Keep going for it, keep going for it. I don't give a fuck. I'm gonna throw everything at it. Me, I think I had a little bit of that I don't give a fuck attitude. Like, I don't care what happens. I'm going to do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you need a little bit of that too. Yeah, you do. And a lot of people don't have that. Yeah. So. Agreed. Yeah. Dead on. And then last but not least, we go back in time in the uh, short story long time capsule. And we're in New York, young John skating around New York, high school. Everything that was on your mind then, everything you were worried about, interested in. If you could tell yourself anything to... Uh, take the edge off, make life a little easier, give yourself a head start, knowing what you know now, what would you say? Well, I think, <laughs> I don't know. Well, I think if I had to tell, I would allow to tell myself anything? Yep. Okay. I would say, don't go on this dumb Wall Street journey. You already have it in you. Go do what you love and go get a job, like I said, in the industry that you love as a, Pee on, yep. uh, empty the garbage, uh, and 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 clean the windows, guy. At the place that you love, instead of like, I I took, I took four years out of my life that I didn't really need to do. I should have just went directly. I think go do what you love, at at a place that does what you love really yeah. well. Yeah. yeah. No matter how much it costs, if you have to sleep in your car, go fucking do it, and work. And, and it, uh, this is a really great piece of advice that I love and I, I love giving to people. Never leave the office before your boss. Yeah. Yeah. That's fucking number one. Yeah. If you leave the office before your boss, you're a loser. Yeah. That's it. I like that. I need to play that for the office. Don't leave before your boss. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, no. Leave before your boss. Yeah. You'll have the same job in 10 years. Yeah, yeah, true. If true. you want to go somewhere yeah. in your world, don't leave before your boss. Yeah. Did you accomplish the bumper sticker goal? Do you do you uh, love your work and never work a day in your life? I do, man, and I'm I'm I'm, I'm almost there. I I'm ninety percent there. I see myself in what I'd really what I really love, and and what I love designing shoes. I love making clothes, but I think I have a shelf life. I think I'm I'm forty four. I don't want to be doing this when I'm fifty. So yeah. I think in the next five to six years. I'm close to being what I do, but I'm already setting up for it. So I have all these investments. I want to probably in the next three or four years start working towards having some type of accelerator, incubator, yeah. type of fund, uh, consultancy type of situation where young people with great ideas can come to me and I can help them. Yeah. I think that's where I will end up. Yeah. So I'm halfway there. We and did you'll it. Be on man. the advisory board. Yeah, please tie me in. We'll do a we'll do a podcast about the launch. Oh yeah, I, you know, I, I'd like to come back once a year here and uh, you know just do a re -up. update. Like what's how's the last year been? We can do a yearly check in with John. Yeah, every can you put it on your calendar. Every October twenty fourth. <laughs> <laughs> we did it, man. Thank you, man. Thank that you so cool. much. Thanks for making that, that happen. Was sick, dude. Guys, if you like that and you want to see more like it as well as vlogs, other web series, and all the random stuff that I'm doing here on YouTube, don't forget to click that subscribe button. You won't regret it. I promise.